Welcome to episode 212 of the Arc Junkies podcast. Today, I'm chatting with Charlie Cross and Padraig Bean of the Lincoln Electric Company about process improvement and welding productivity. We'll get right into it right after a quick word from the supporters of the show. Today's episode of the Arc Junkies podcast is brought to you by Everlast Welders. Did you know they make multi-process machines? I'm not talking about your typical stick, MIG, and TIG machines either. Everlast has a stick, MIG, and plasma machine. Yes, you heard that right. Stick, MIG, and plasma. Now you can cut out all your parts and weld them together with a single power source. Once again, saving you time, money, and precious floor space in your shop. Head on over to EverlastWalters.com and check out the new Storm 215C today. Stop cutting out all your parts with a cutoff wheel or a saw blade. You're just making a mess in your shop. Switch over to Plasma and increase speed, accuracy, and cut quality with the power of Plasma. In addition, they carry a full line of other single and multi-process machines for every budget and even offer financing for your small business. Some of the models are even dual voltage, meaning you can run them on 110 or 220 volt. Check out their full line of machines today at EverlastWelders.com. And make sure to use code word ARCJUNKIES in the comment section at checkout when you buy any machine that comes with a stock foot pedal and get that free Nova foot pedal and TIG torch upgrade. It's a $100 value. Everlast Welders. Weld mean, weld green. We're also brought to you by Rock Mount Research and Alloys. These guys make some of the coolest stuff available for welding repairs. I can't believe I've been welding for as long as I have been and have never heard of their maintenance rods, wires, and other accessories that they have available. How many times have you ever welded the same crack on a piece of equipment because it continues to break even though you did everything right? Well, maybe not everything. Sometimes the material seems like it's steel to steel, but maybe what you're dealing with is dissimilar alloys, and you're trying to weld it with 7018, 6010, or 70S6. Well, I encourage you to try out some of their Brutus rods. Or maybe you've broken off an extractor trying to pull a snap bolt. Guess what? Brutus to the rescue again. Or maybe you need to cut a groove in a crack to make a repair, but you can't fit the grinder in there and you don't have access to a compressor on your rig to arc gouge it out. Well, that's not a problem either. Grab a rock mount electro rod and cut that groove out without the noise, sparks, and fumes of carbon arc gouging. Go check out their website today, rockmountwelding.com, and see what solutions they might have to help you deal with your most popular repair. Whenever you place your order, tell them the arc junkie sent you. We're also brought to you by Lincoln Electric, the welding experts. Whether you need a machine, consumables, PPE, or in-person training to take the next step in your welding journey, Lincoln has you covered. They have classes for everyone to include their welding school to learn basics of welding, advanced motorsports, practical weld inspection, advanced welding technology, welding productivity, welding procedure development, CWI prep courses, and many more. Regardless of where you're at on your welding journey, Lincoln has the classes to help you take the next step and get your current skills to the next level. You can find out more information on their classes and in-person seminars by going to classes.lincolnelectric.com. And if you're looking to save some money on equipment, you can find your next machine or fume extractor and save 10% when you go to store.lincolnelectric.com and use Arc Junkies 10 at checkout. You can also save up to 20% on welding gear, accessories, tools, and filler metals when you use Arc Junkies 20 at checkout. That's store.lincolnelectric.com. Lincoln Electric, the welding experts. All right, it's that time of year again. The Kentucky Welding Institute High School Senior Welding Contest will be held on April 23rd, and over $100,000 in scholarships and other prizes will be handed out. There's also going to be special appearances by Stephanie Hoffman, Jacob Schofield, Ray Ripple, John Winslow, the Arc Junkies Podcast, and many more, along with sponsors and vendors to include industry-respected brands such as Up and Smoke Welding Apparel, Outlaw Leather, Aluma Reel, Heavy Hitters Tig Rigs, and many more. First place of the competition is going to walk away with a fully restored 1967 Lincoln Electric Classic Red Face and a pile of other prizes, while second and third are going to win their respective choice of a Lincoln Electric or a Miller Inverter welding machine. The contest is going to be a 2G and 3G with backing weld test with 8th inch 7018. Coupons will be cut and bent to determine the winner. There's also going to be an OxyFuel cutting contest with great prizes. Last year's event had over 100 welding competitors from 17 different states, and this year's already shaping up to top that. The event's going to kick off Friday evening with a casual event full of food, games, live music, a chance to tour the facility, meet some welding influencers, and chat with KWI staff and simply relax before Saturday's contest. So if you think you've got what it takes and want to test your welds against some of the best in the nation, go ahead and sign up. Be at the Kentucky Welding Institute on April 23rd. You can register online at www.kwi.us and find out details on any social media platform or you can call 606 606- 849-WELD. All right, you know what time it is. Fire up your machine, drop your hood, and turn me up five. This is Rush Kane, and you're listening to the Arc Junkies Podcast. You're 
listening to the Art Junkies Podcast. Helping you make every weld better than your last with each episode. And now your host, Jason Becker. All right, so today I have Charlie Cross and Padraic Bean on the show. Padraic Bean's been on the podcast. He was on here a while back talking about uh, some different weld procedures, uh, process improvement, and then Charlie Cross. I got the, the pleasure of meeting Charlie Cross back in 2016 when I got into education. He and Ryan Eubank put on the Welding Educator Workshops up at Lincoln Electric in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, like, like Ryan and Charlie will tell you, you know, if you're the smartest person in the room, you need to find another room to hang out with. So I invited them on the show you know, so I wasn't the uh, the smartest person in the room. We want to surround yourself with other individuals that are more intelligent than you are, or, you know, they're at the level where you want to be one day. So I brought in Charlie and Padraic because I look up to both of these guys as friends and mentors uh, because they're very smart when it comes to welding. And that's the level that I want to attain. That's why I did the episode on, you know, the different resources that are available, different books, you know, trying to give people more information so I wanted to bring them on the show today to talk about, you know, weld procedure development, process improvement. This is what Charlie and, and Padraic deal with on a daily basis, whether it's education and training or, you know, developing new welding procedures or, you know, just working with end users on how to improve production and improve their process. So, guys, welcome to the show. Thanks for having Thanks us, for man. Having us. Oh, no problem. It is, uh, it, it's awesome to be back, and uh, thank you very much for the uh, – for the stellar introduction, it's uh, it's definitely flattering. It's a lot to live up to, though, but much appreciated. Oh, no problem. So I just I recently got back from we I took a class I took y'all's class up in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, for well procedure development, and I was like, damn, we're we're covering a lot of great stuff in this class. Why not share it with the masses? You know, and uh, that's one thing I've always been a big proponent of. You know, throughout my welding career is always taking that next step. And every time I feel like I'm in a rut, you know, I'll go take a class somewhere and just try to, you know, level up, you know, cause you start getting comfortable and then, you know, you're, you're not growing at that point, you know? So I try to put myself in uncomfortable positions so that I'm continuing, you know, to grow on a professional level, whether it's uh, hands-on training, you know, learning new uh, welding procedures and processes, you know, like we discovered, uh, I, well, I got to learn hyperfill while I was up there a little bit about that developing well procedures because now that, you know, I'm part of an accredited testing facility, you know, like people are going to want to come in and test for various things, not just the pre-qualified stuff that's listed out in D11, you know, so I've got to work in D12 a little bit recently. Um, but yeah, that's, that's why I wanted to get you guys on the show because, you know, I want to get that information out to the masses and share that with people and say, Hey, you know, there's, there's more to welding than what's under the hood. So I want to kick it off with, uh, Charlie, we talked about Weld procedure development and, you know, the big six, the six items to assure quality. So we had um, process selection, joint preparation, the different procedures we're going to be using, pre-testing, personnel, and in-process monitoring. Yeah, so, so Jason, back to what you were saying, for personnel or for the process, uh, most of the times a fabricator is already going to know the process they're working to. They're typically comfortable to the process. Typically they have personnel that might be qualified to weld with that process. They may already know the joint design. The, the really uh, most cur cutting edge theme that I'm seeing right now is the in-process monitoring. And that's where a lot of the technology is coming into play where it's not like you're welding and you just turn it up and you turn it down. All that data is getting recorded. If you, if you follow in-process monitoring, utilizing technology these days. Most high level equipment manufacturers in the welding industry have machines capable of being connected to the network or to the internet of things that'll, that'll, that'll collect the data, whether it's your voltage, amperage, wire feed speed. In some cases, it can help you calculate the heat inputs, the time, the operator. And then you can figure out uh, maybe how much a part costs to make to the second. Uh, being able to control these variables and monitor these variables in process help find the problem before it becomes a major problem down the line. Yeah, I, th I thought it was really cool that you guys have the PowerWave manager. So now you can walk up to your welding machine, you can plug in a laptop, and you can record all your data in real time. So if you're developing a procedure, I mean, that thing's like, you, you can't fake the funk. You know, you 
typically we'd have a guy standing there or a person standing there as we're performing the welds, monitoring voltage, wire feed speed, amperage, uh, travel speed, you know, the weld length, the amount of heat input in there, you know, when we figure out when we calculate joules. But the I was blown away by the the power wave manager because it's it's not something I've had the opportunity to use yet. And I really didn't understand how powerful of a tool it was, you know, just from a welding educator's perspective, just being able to, okay, yeah, I can, I can watch my amps and volts, but if I have to sit down and write a procedure and a lot of times, like I'm just, I'm one person, you know, so like I can't, uh, accurately clock my travel speed. I can't, you know, and then I have to do all the math to figure out the, the amount of heat input that I put into a part, but the power wave manager actually collects and holds all that data for you. So then you can just transcribe that directly to your welding procedure specification, you know, based off of, you know, the number of wells that you did, you know, especially if you're doing like multi-pass applications or, you know, any, anything of that nature, you have all the raw data right there. And like Charlie, you were saying, you know, a lot of times this helps big companies with litigation, you know, did this part get welded correctly? Yes. I have all the data right here to back up, you know, that we follow the procedure to the letter. You know, I think that's a, I think that's an interesting point about having, having the actual printout, the printout from the computer that tells you what you did. Right. Um, you know, when we talk about procedure development and, you know, up until things like power wave manager came out, you, you had somebody sitting there and, you know, either with a, with a voltmeter or watching the display on a machine and saying, well, you know, I think it was, you know, I think it was generally, you know, 26 volts. Mm. Right. Well, in this day and age with regulations getting tighter and tighter and tighter standards and specifications getting tighter and tighter and tighter. I mean, let's face it. As we go on that's standing in front of the computer and saying, Oh, I think it was 26. Oh, I think it was 25. That's not going to be good enough anymore. Um, you know, we're, we're coming into an age where documentation for all of this stuff, it's, it's going to have to be, uh, a lot more automated. Um, and, and I think compliance is going that route, right? You know, people are going to want the digital readout. People are, are people are going to want the actual, uh, you know, Excel sheet readout. Um, yeah. Standing in front of the machine and saying, Oh, I think I was at this amperage and voltage. I, that's not going to cut it anymore. Yeah. And, and that's the same thing yeah. I've run into like, at, you know, running an ATF because I verify each machine as you know, during the process. So I'm checking the voltage on the, on the display, but I'm also, <laughs> with a calibrated multimeter, you know, checking the voltage and checking the amperage to make sure that that machine's putting out exactly what it says it's putting out, you know, because I have to document that, you know, through the process, but with the, with these new technologies that are in place, it's making that even easier because now I can record all that data and then staple it, you know, all together with the, the packet that I'm going to submit. Yeah. Yeah. J Jason, you, you, you did a great job with the introductions and everything. It was really, really humbling to hear that. But one of the things you need to realize is we all stand on the shoulders of giants and the way that things have been done historically, that that still, that still works. I mean, that's, you're still able to do it that way. I think the thing that we need to all focus on is the two big words that I tried to make sure that people would, people walk away when they take a weld procedure development seminar, we're involved with weld procedure development. And those two words are accountability and traceability. So what were the parameters who made the parameters? Um, and then were they sound, can you back it up with a piece of documentation, uh, the best possible way? Did you record exactly what you did? Mm -hmm. And you're going to put your name behind that and say that you're accountable for that. And, you better have that piece documentation to back that up. Right. And that, that kind of leads me into another question is we talk about welding procedure specifications all the time, but there's a lot of companies out there that simply they don't use them. You know, the, the company really has a, a vague idea of what actually happens with welding. They hire what they consider to be some subject matter experts. Here's the prints, put a quarter inch fillet weld on this material and, you know, weld it out. We got to crank out 300 parts. What would, you know, what's the, what's the benefit of having, you know, a company say, Hey, you know, let's, let's bring in a CWI or a CWS for a couple of days and let's actually develop some procedures for the bulk of the work that we do. So what's the, what's the benefit in having well procedure specifications on hand instead of relying on, you know, the knowledge of the welder and the paint marks that, you know, somebody else put on the machine for us to, to match up our wire feed speed and voltage. It, it's pretty simple. 
what gets measured gets managed. Um, if we can measure it, we can manage it. And then if we are able to manage it, we can then improve it. The well procedure specification is going to give us a baseline of where we're at. If we just have a paint pen on a machine, we don't know if they actually were following that necessarily. We don't have any documentation as a set point to go off of mm -hmm. if there's a problem. Right. And where, where would it kind of help a company to have procedures in place? You know, I, I think when you have procedures in place and, and I think there's a common misconception that just that if you're not working, say, uh, to a specific code, you know, if you don't have a specific code requirement, there's some sort of misconception that says that, you know, we don't need welding procedures or, or we don't use welding procedures because we're not working to a code, you know, codes very specifically outline what has to be in a welding procedure to, to meet that code, but there's nothing stopping the mom and pop shops from, from having something written down that says, you know, this wire speed, this amperage, this voltage, this travel speed, it's going to give us a, a desirable result. Right. And, and I kind of liken it to like, uh, to food, right. You know, when you go in, when you go into a, a McDonald's anywhere around the country, you buy a Big Mac, a Big Mac is a Big Mac. You got two all beef patties, you know, let, you know, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, two pickles, uh, onions on a sesame seed bun, right? It's the same thing, no matter where you go. Cause they all follow the same recipe, right there. They have a, they have a known result. If they follow that recipe, that's really what the welding procedure does. That's the recipe for the welder to follow, to get a desirable result. And whether or not you're a, a, a you know, a place that's building structural steel that's working to the D11, or you're building uh, handrails and you don't have a, necessarily have a code that you have to be compliant to, those welding procedures are going to help the people in your shop be successful in the welds that they're laying down. I think re repeatability is is a huge factor because like you were saying, you know, if, if you got somebody that's building handrails, okay, I mean, they got to withstand like a 250-pound side force load. So sure. in order to achieve that, you know, we, we want to make sure that whoever's welding this is doing it correctly. You know, so you can't rely on the paint marks that, you know, old Bob, you know, he, he put the, you know, the marks on the machine. That's just where we set it and, and it works. Because, you know, at the end of the day, machines aren't always going to maintain that level of accuracy. You know, so what was in a lot of companies, they're not, they're not big on upgrading their equipment. You know, I've worked in shops that, hell, the, old, the, the welding equipment was older than I am. You know, so... <clears throat> to develop a procedure that way, if, if someone, you know, moves on from, you know, that current employer, they, they go somewhere else. The next guy can come in, they can open up that welding procedure and say, okay, we're doing uh, we're doing quarter inch plate and a fillet weld, you know, here's the wire feed speed. Here's the gas. You know, they, they have a procedure to follow a recipe, if you will, so that their big Mac has, it's the same big Mac that they've been selling for the past 20 years. You know, that, that next welder can come in there, follow that procedure and just kind of go to work. Well, let's not forget. I mean, that WPS is an end result right? That's an end result to a process. Having that document that tells you those settings that tells you, you know, your amperage voltage wire speed, there's, there's a pretty big step that needs to happen before that. And that's, you know, that's really, in my opinion, the most important step. And that's where you, you do testing, you know, you, you, you run out a test plate or a pipe or, or, or what have you, you use the parameters that you're going to be using in production. And then you do some sort of testing to let you know that, yes, this gives us repeatable, reliable results. Um, and you know, that, that sort of testing, and we talked about it in the class, right. You know, doing fillet weld brake testing, that's not something that you have to be a, you know, a huge multi-million dollar shop to be able to be able to do. Right. You know, I was, I was, I was in a place a while back and we were talking about, um, we were talking about uh, short circuit MIG welding techniques, right? And I was working with a bunch of welders who had, I mean, they had a lot of experience in the industry and to their own right. I mean, we're very skilled welders. And I mentioned that maybe we should try a particular technique. And their answer was, well, this is the particular technique that we like to use. So we have the technique that they like to use on one hand and the technique that I used like to use on the other. So my approach to that is, well, let's do a test plate. Let's break it. Let's see what the results are. And you find a lot of times that the that techniques that people use, if they haven't done the destructive testing to, to really validate the efficacy of those techniques, what they find out is, ooh, maybe there is some room for improvement. Mm -hmm. I've seen that a lot on doing a, like a whip and, <laughs> whip and pause technique versus a straight push technique. 
and you do a fill yep. well break test and there's really no comparison because everybody wants to do the whip and pause or the stack of dimes because that's what they see on Instagram. That's what's cool. That's what's, you know, in air quotes, that's what's sexy. That's what looks good. But it's like pig. But, yeah. Big like pig. But at the end of the day, every time you're whipping and pausing, your, your amps are just fluctuating off the chart. You know, you're going up and down 20, 25 amps. And yep. as we know, amps and travel speed, that's kind of, that's where the bulk of our heat is. You know, so if you're, if you're kind of whipping in, you're just pausing for a quick second and then whipping back out, you know, you're, you're not bringing that heat with you, you know, especially in a short circuit application, which nine times out of 10, that's what a lot of people are using. Whip and pause is great for like a 60, 10, you know, fast freeze electrode. It really doesn't have, there, there, I don't want to say it doesn't have a place in gas metal arc welding. It does to an extent, you know, for, for thin gauge stuff. But, you know, if you're whipping and pausing on like quarter inch, five sixteenths, you know, you're not getting that penetration you need. And until, like you said, you do some testing on it, you're not going to see that because it's everything on the surface looks great. But, you know, when you park that forklift over top of that fixture and you, you throw that T-joint in there and you snap it with that handle, you can actually see, okay, the root has no fusion, but the surface looks beautiful. And, yep. you know, Charlie, like you were saying in the class, you know, when you when you opened up the class, you know, when we talked about weld procedure development, you said the least expensive weld is made once. And the most expensive weld is the one that fails and hurts someone. And I think that's what it usually takes for somebody to understand, hey, you know, we should probably have some procedures in place to safeguard us against that and it, or at least have the documentation backed up that we did we did our due diligence. We did everything we were supposed to to make sure that the product that we welded on and sent out the door and put into service is safe for the end use. You know, and what you're talking about there, it's, it's more than just, um, it's more than, that's more than looking at welding as the welding process itself, right? That's when you really start to look at welding as a special process as a whole. Um, and that's how you really start to control your, your production processes and, and really, and really have some faith in the product that you're putting out. Right. Um, but that, but that starts at the very beginning. I mean, that starts at the procedure development that starts with writing, writing actual workable WPSs. I mean, as, as we all know, I'm sure we've all seen WPSs that, you know, if you really tried to put the ranges, uh, into practice may or may not work, you know, so writing really good workable WPSs. um, welder qualification and training monitoring and inspection processes, you know, you put all those things together and you start looking at welding. It's not just the welding process itself, but as a, uh, as an overarching special process, that's where you really start to get control of your program. Jason, you know, I'm a pretty simple man. Um, I like things in three. I have three kids to the same wife. So Padraic and I, we he, he likes things in three too, don't you, Padraic? Always. I've got well, same thing. One wife, three kids. <laughs> okay. And so when we're going around and we 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 deal with some issues, the, the big three things that that we look at. I'm like I said, I'm a very simple person. I dress like Dilbert every day almost when I have to go to work. And so when I show up somewhere, I walk in almost almost like somebody that that you wouldn't think has any clue about welding. And the, the fact is, is the places that have the knobs with the paint pens on it. A lot of times people have a challenge explaining what the knobs do. What I've found is there are three big things and, and three key areas that you can ask questions. And those big three questions you can ask really to find a pain point would be, do you have work instructions? Do you have them? Do you use them? Are they any good? The other thing I'd ask is, do you have weld procedures? Do you have them? Do you use them? Are they any good? And then the third thing I'd ask is, do you have a technical print? Do you have them? Do you use them? Are they any good? Looking at, looking at a work instruction, if somebody's involved in the welding operation, Part of the work instruction could be part of the sequence that they might be welding because there could be several procedures that they would have to follow for different materials. Are they following the appropriate sequence? Are they avoiding distortion? Are they avoiding any before welding or after welding concerns? 
do they know what it takes step one, two, three, four, and five? Do they understand that? And that's typically you talk to like a manufacturing type engineer. The, the sec weld procedures, we typically deal with the welding specialist, whether it's an engineer, CWI, that has a full understanding of weld procedures. And it, do they follow a code? Do they not follow a code? Do you have the, the big six of a WPS listed? Um, do you use them? Do you have them? Are they any good? A, a WPS locked up in a cabinet does no good. Uh, and then the third thing is technical print. Do we understand what the technical print does? Are we using the technical print currently? Jason, those three things can help help find a pain point and can help with the in-process monitoring concerns to improve quality. Now, you, you mentioned when you talked about a WPS, do you have the big six? Now, I, I already know the answer to this, but I want, I want to run down the big six for a welding procedure specification because, like you guys were saying, you know, like we probably built like 17 – Without exaggeration, we probably built 15 to 17 welding procedure specifications. Indeed, even did a PQR and a welder performance qualification record during, you know, the, the time that I was in your class. But, you know, you talk about the big six for the WPSs. That's helped me quite a bit because now <clears throat> I'm, I'm having to evaluate customers' WPSs and cross-reference them against a PQR. And those, those big six right there, I mean, that, that's the key ticket for your WPS. You know, when we talk about essential variables, what is involved with a welding procedure specification? So I, want, I wanted you to kind of run through the, the big six that you called it because that, that made it very simple for me because, you know, like I'm a welder at heart and I only have 10 fingers. So anytime I can count less than 10, like you got my vote, you know, so having three things or six things, anything less than 10, you know, like I'm on board. I can remember that stuff. 2022 code book yeah, came out. They've got 11. You know, I got to take off a boot now. Uh, it, it's getting really frustrating. You know, <laughs> I got to count through all this stuff. But I want, I want you to cover the, the big six of a weld procedure development. Ideally, I'll, I'll list five of them, and I'll tell you the sixth thing is really what's going to make a welding specialist is I'll lay all of them out, and then I'll elaborate on each one. And, and the first thing is process. Number two is joint design. Number three is filler metal. Four is base metal. Five is thermal conditions. And then number six, you have to pull your other hand out, Jason. I, I've got and your I've six got two fingers going to be your, your six fingers going to be called the parameter side. And that's where the that's where the welding specialist where where your welding skills are really going to come into hand. Where your background and knowledge is because if you if you if you look at how you make a weld procedure, everything involved in making a quality weld. You start at the process, a weld process. Number one is a weld process. So we're talking like stick, Ch TIG, TIG, flux core, whatever that process is. Chances are you already have that equipment and you already know how to use it. But you already invested in that capital equipment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we already know we're stuck with using that. The next thing is the joint design. Number two is joint design. Could be a, could be a, um, a butt joint. It could be a... T joint, it could be a corner joint, a parallel or a lap joint. And then we could have a fillet weld in a T joint. We could have a bevel groove weld in a butt joint, et cetera, et cetera. Number three, filler metal. What type of filler metal are you using? What depends with what process you're using, right? So what size is the filler metal you're using? Can your machine handle that filler metal that you're using based off of the size and what you're trying to accomplish? Number four gets us into the base metal. The base metal typically is already prescribed by the designer. It, it typically is already spelled out in a contract document. And thus, since you already have the filler metal and the base metal, you have to find out there may be some thermal conditions that you might be addressing. Is it a low, low hydrogen electrode, a non-low hydrogen electrode? And then number six takes us to where the money is. And that's the parameters. And Jason, I've heard your podcast numerous times. You referenced the Lincoln Electric Consumable Catalog for some of your parameters when you're working with your students. And, you know, looking at an equipment manufacturer and also a consumable manufacturer's catalogs for, for data to get those set points is critical. And being able to reference and find that documentation is going to be critical with the parameter side. Yeah, I think that's like, like you said, the biggest takeaway is, is number six, your parameters. What are you running it to? 
because everybody's like, oh, I like to run a little bit hotter and I like to run, you know, a little bit colder or, you know, I like to, I like to run this. I like to run that. So like everybody has their own personal preference depending on their welding style, where they went to school. Like, you know, I, I run a lot of like, I do a lot of D11 stuff. I do a lot of, you know, shield of metal arc welding demonstrations. And I, I like to run my eighth inch diameter electrode at 110 amps. Now, 110 amps on, you know, like a five foot stinger for the vertical on a three eighths test plate, even one inch test plate. And I 99.9% of the time I'll pass that test. No problem at 110 amps. But a lot of people tell me, oh, you're running way too cold. You need to be, you know, I run, I run anywhere from 125 to 140 on the job site. Well, you might, but let's take it in consideration. How long is your lead? You know, do you have any, you know, points of resistance in your system? You know, so I, I think having a, a procedure that's actually developed that tells you exactly, it specs out exactly, you know, travel speed, amps, like it lays everything out. It's the recipe once again. So when some people tell me I'm, I'm running too cold, I might be running too cold for you, but I'm, I'm running a lot slower than you as well. So my heat input is pretty significant compared to, you know, you running at 125 amps. If you're running 10 to 12 inches a minute, I might be running six inches a minute. I'm still getting adequate penetration. You know, we, we can, you know, meet at the same at the end of the day. And that's why, you know, with, um, when we talk about our essential variables, we have percentages, you know, plus or minus 25%, plus or minus 10%. You know, we have this built into the system, but at least we can all follow the same guidelines. You know, we have that relative guideline. You know, we talk about travel speed. It could be anywhere from eight to 12 inches a minute. You know, as long as we're hitting the same, same points, you know, we're, we're going to come up with the same end product. And that's, you know, that's what we're looking for is repeatability, regardless of whose whose hand that stinger is in or whose hand that gun's in. You know, we want a repeatable process, you know, whether it's Charlie Cross, Padraic Bean or Jason Becker welding this piece out. We want to have the same end result. And you guys have to operate within these specific set parameters here that we've we've what? we've done. We've tested and they've proven to work. And that's why we have what they call, you know, pre-qualified procedures or pre-qualified processes through D11. You know, we can do these things and kind of everybody, you've got repeatable results. You know, you, you made an interesting comment about, you know, like if the three of us are, you know, say we're, we're working on a job site, you know, you've got one place you like to run it. I've got one place I like to run it. Charlie's got one place that he likes to run it. And, and that is a very welder viewpoint. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was a welder for a long time, but once I left the actual hands-on welding side of it, I got into the quality and technical welding program management side of it. Right. And my, my viewpoints on welding changed astronomically. Right. Um, so when you say like, you know, that's the way somebody likes to do it. I mean, from my viewpoint, I'll tell you how I like to weld. Right. And, and this goes beyond, you know, laying down this one weld in the shop. This is like a very macro sense of how I like to weld. Right. I like to weld in, uh, the way that's going to give me the most repeatable and robust results, the way that I can train the most welders, the fastest to do it. And the way that I can do it fastest in production to make myself the most money. Mm -hmm. It needs to give me all three of those things. It needs to be, you know, effective for production. All three, Charlie needs to be effective for production. I need to be able to effectively train welders to do it. Um, and it needs to give me the right, and it needs to uh, uh, be repeatable. Give me the right results. Right. And, from a program management side of it, I like to take all of those feelings <laughs> and, and thoughts about welding and, you know, like how you like to do it, how I like to do it, how Jim likes to do it. I, I push all of those aside. Um, and, and that's really how I think, you know, from a, you know, from a controlling the process standpoint, that's really how in a lot of cases we need to look at welding. You know, one of the things that I find, uh, find interesting too was, where does somebody even start? Uh, uh, Jason came up to Padraic and I at the end of the uh, at the end of the seminar and said, "Hey, I have this aluminum project going on, and kind of just just try it's it's. I know we focused on D one one this week. Where wh where do I start asking the person? They they just said, I need some help with this. And so, what are some common questions you ask and we, you know, in order to get those big three things, Padraic, if we go back to what's the process, what's the joint design, what's the filler metal, 
base metal, thermal conditions, then we can figure out the parameters and dial it in. Chances are those five things are already figured out. It'll be up to some, that's essentially what we walked Jason through. We said, Jason, what's the process? He said, GMAW, what's the joint design? Oh, it's a, but it's a, it's a groove, square groove weld and a butt joint. What's a filler metal? Oh, it's going to be a, uh, a 364-4043. Well, what's the base metal? 6061 T6. Uh, there, there's no thermal conditions necessary. Okay, well, let's look at the catalog. Let's look at our documentation that we have available, all the resources that are provided, and let's get some parameters dialed in for him right there. And then from there, then his, then his, um, the person that he's working with can have that dialed procedure, and then they can mo- make the most economical weld because, as we like to repeat, the most economical weld is the weld that's only made once. Right. And it, most I, expensive weld could could be one that fails and then the third thing is is the third question you follow up is what's the pain point yeah if there is any and i like the fact that you brought that up because that was you know the, the thing that i pitched to you because at the end of the day i mean like that's what the client that's the information the client provided me and we had that conversation about probably at 11 30 maybe 12 o'clock over you know eating lunch uh there at the uh the atlanta facility and then as i'm driving home i get an email yeah, we're not we're not going to do that whole process. We're going to switch the process over to gas tungsten arc welding, and we're instead of a you know on on this joint configuration, we're going to do a T joint, and we're going to use this type of filler metal, uh, this you know thickness of material. And I'm like, man, like oh man, I had everything figured out so that I could run all these tests and stuff, you know, like test the welders, test the product, and everything was completely different. But you know, because I had that that big six with me, I was like, okay. You know, training wheels are off now. You know, I got to put on my big boy pants. What's the process? Okay, we're, we're switching from gas metal arc welding to gas tungsten arc welding. Instead of, uh, you know, the, uh, a square groove butt joint, we're doing a fillet joint. Okay, cool. Base metal is going to stay the same. You know, at least we got that going for us, right? We're still staying in the, in the D12 code book. Thermal requirements. Okay, there's still no pre, post, or inner pass temperatures that are, you know, considered an essential variable for what we're doing. Filler metal, we're going to switch it up, you know, and we're going to do a, um, I think we ended up using a 5356. And then, you know, the weld parameters, what are the weld parameters going to be? And according to their WPS, I feel that they're, they were a little bit cold for what they were doing, you know, because we're joining half inch plate to quarter inch plate. And I think they maxed out at like with, with the essential variables and the allowable percentages of increase and decrease, I think we hit like 205 amps. So I was like, we're going to have to back down that travel speed just a little bit, you know, but I'm interested because um, now that the test has been conducted and everything, I've got to cut it apart. I've got to get some specific acids and everything to do the macro etch. And apparently they, they've got it all out in California, but it, it's like 200 bucks to get it over here overnight. So we're just going to do the standard, you know, ground travel because it's, it's hazmat and everything causes cancer. And, you know, anyway, uh, so that, that the, the chemical solution should have been delivered today, but now I get to do a cut and etch on this material. And then I went ahead and built the, the same fillet well break test that you guys had over there. Cause 99.9% of the stuff I've done up to this point is always a, a guided bend test, you know? So I've, I've got that set up, you know, I got the different dies rollers. I've got the adjustable triangle engineering, you know, fixture, all that's great, but Hey, now I got to do a fillet well break test. Well, damn it. You know? So, I built the apparatus to do a fillet well break test, forklift not included. Uh, but, so we're going to go ahead and, and I'm going to cut an etch and do the do the break test on Monday. And you know, like like kind of going back, you know, we were talking about like I had I had this whole setup in in mind that the, you know the client told me here's what we're going to do, and then at the eleventh hour they changed everything up. But because I understood the big six going through that process, looking at a new welding procedure specification. I was able to say, okay, no problem. You know, I got home, I, I shoved my nose in the code book in the D12 and figured out exactly what I had to do for Friday morning. And that that's the thing, you know, like D11's always been like, that's my comfort zone. You know, I've been working in that code book for, you know, since Moby Dick was a minnow. Like I, I've been in there for a while and now like switching over to D12, that's a completely different code book. You know, it, it's, but it's, you know, like Charlie was saying, you know, it's, it's claws, tables, figures. So kind of once you get past that apprehension, you understand how to navigate that code book as well. You know, so having the the procedures, you know, the big six and then a new code book and understanding how to read and interpret that, I'm much more comfortable in, you know, what I have in front of me. 
you know, you talked about, I think like two of my absolute most favorite things in the world right there. I, I absolutely love macros, man. I do. I just, I, I love them. You know, I, I think that, uh, you know, yeah, you can use them for qualification and, you know, of uh, personnel and procedures, but I think any shop that can look at macros and bring those into their repertoire of stuff that they are confident and capable of doing, even if it's the mom and pop shop, right? I mean, a macro of a test plate, um, you don't even have to put it under a microscope. I mean, a macro of a test plate, tells you, I mean, am, you know, in a fillet weld, for example, am I getting fusion to the root or am I not? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and, you know, and, and, you know, talking to somebody who has looked at macros, right. I really like it for a teaching tool because you get a real good idea of, you know, say somebody's, uh, somebody's work angle, for instance, you can get an excellent idea of somebody's work angle and you can show that right to the welder. Hey, when you travel with this work angle, this is the result. Maybe we need to change it like this. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's pretty good feedback for them. Um, in fill it well, brake tests, right? Um, brake testing and macros, I think go hand in hand. Macros are great because it gives you that, that real good look at the actual penetration profiles, but they also have their fallbacks, right? I mean, a macro is only a, it's a moment in time mm -hmm. throughout a, a test plate. You throw the fillet well brake test in there now. Well, now we got a good look at the, the penetration profile with the macros. And now I can see throughout the whole weld, is this robust? And I think, I think any shop, can throw that into their, into their bag of tricks. Right. You know, I know the codes don't talk about it. Um, but Charlie and I, I know we talked about it extensively, right. You know, when we looked at pre-qualified procedures, okay. All the steps for writing a pre-qualified procedure and getting that document out there, that's the code minimum requirement. That's what you have to do to produce the document. But, but I would contend that there are more steps that if you really want to add, if you really want to put that WPS into place and have confidence in it, there's a validation step that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and it could be bend testing. I mean, sure. Right. You could do bend testing. It could even be macros. It doesn't matter what joint configuration you're doing. You can cut a, a, a square groove. You can cut a single bevel groove. You can cut a fillet. You can cut, um, you know, a, a flare bevel groove, you can cut and etch all of those and measure exactly what you're getting. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, and especially if you have a shop, you know, you're doing carbon steel. I mean, what you have a bottle of night all, um, and a magnifying glass, it doesn't have to be anything crazy, but these are things that I think shops can easily implement to give themselves for lack of better term, the warm and fuzzy that no matter, you know, even if it's pre-qualified, and the code says it's good because it's pre-qualified. It gives them that validation to really put it out onto the shop floor and have confidence in it. Right. And, and I think that's one thing that like shop employers and, you know, companies, they should understand be, like a lot of the folks that I deal with, I do, I deal with a lot of small mom and pop shops and they're like, you know, Hey, I, I need to, uh, I need to certify my guys. Okay. What, what, what do you need to certify them to? Uh, you know, this, this specific code book, Okay, do you have a copy of that code book? Do you know what's actually required for that? Well, no. Okay, step one. Like, you should have a copy of the code book and at least understand, you know, what your well. If you have to weld to these requirements, you should at least have a general understanding of what these requirements are. You know, because if you're out there bidding work and performing the work, are you really compliant with what you're doing? Probably not. You know, like, <clears throat> it, 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 it kind of baffles me, but and, and I don't know where the disconnect is between you know, what the requirements are from a code standpoint and, you know, people starting up a business and say, Hey, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to fire up a welding business and I'm going to start bidding on all this work. You could probably bid on a lot more work if you understood what was in those contract documents, or at least keep your head above water. When you, you bid a job and you get awarded that job for a specific price. And now, Oh man, like all my, all my welders have to be, you know, code compliant to this specific code book. What's it going to take to get me, you know, to get all these guys caught up to this or, you know, so now, now you have to certify a whole bunch of people and, you know, at X amount of dollars a pop or, you, you know, you're hiring an in-house CWI. Like, are you really bidding that job appropriately to, to be able to fit those needs? You know, Charlie talks about the welds that, that that's going to cost you the most, right? I mean, that's like you said, that's the one that fails mm -hmm. and, that's the, and it's the one that hurts somebody, right? 
Um, but I think at the end of the day, what really, what really costs the most money in a welding program is surprises. And yes. that's what you're talking about there, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, you, you bid a job, maybe you didn't quite understand exactly what that job entailed or what the requirements were. And then somewhere along the line, whether you caught it, I mean, if, if the shop caught it, they're lucky. Um, if they're unlucky, somebody who represents their customer came in and caught it during an audit, right? Mm -hmm. So now they have to fix it and they have to fix it in pretty short order. Um, you know, if, and to do that, you know, like you said, I mean, you got to qual qualify or certify X amount of welders in this short time frame. You're going to try to, uh, you're going to try to get into an ATF maybe to do that. You know, somebody's going to go to Valencia college and say, Jason, I need six people done and I need it done now. Mm -hmm. You know, that's going to cost them some money, right? Where if they had, if they had had the ability to plan out the project a little bit better, a little farther in advance, um, and then, and put the right heads around the planning, they could have kind of headed off some of those surprises at the pass. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, yeah, you still got to qualify six welders, but you know, now I can budget it out over six weeks, you know, so it's not going to hit me as hard. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, there's, there's some tools I think in, in manufacturing um, that help you predict things like that, that help you predict these, these potential issues. Um, you know, there's a tool, uh, that I used to use on a pretty frequent basis. You guys heard me use the acronym, uh, like crazy when we were in Atlanta, right? It's called a PFMEA. It's a process failure mode effect analysis, All right? So if, if you, Charlie and I, we run a welding shop, right? And we're going to take on a new contract before we go to our final bid, we're going to look at, okay where are all the places that our process as a whole could fail? Everyone wants to talk about successes and that's great. I want to talk about failures and I want to know what's going to happen before it happens. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and we go over everything. I mean, we talk about, you know, what happens if we get porosity, right? What happens if we get lack of fusion? Um, you know, do we need to qualify our welders? Do we need training? You know, and we look at all the places where we could fail and you look at, Okay. If it fails, what's the severity, you know, so one, one to 10. Um, so you look at, uh, the severity, um, then you look at your, your likelihood of detection, you know, and one would be extremely likely that, that we're going to detect it. And a 10 is extremely unlikely. Um, and then you look at what the likelihood of the failure is. How many times are we going to run into it, right? You take all those numbers, you multi multiply them together, and those tell you what your biggest risks are. And those are the risks you work on. Those are the risks that you try to fix. Um, you know, Charlie talks about things being measured. You know, if um, things that are measured get improved, right? This is a measured way of going about risk analysis and a welding program that help you make the most effective changes to your program and not have surprises. Cause those surprises are what really end up costing you the most amount of money. So one of the things, and I, I, I kind of wear two hats. I, I represent Lincoln electric and the American welding society being involved with the CWI program. But another good program out there is the certified welding supervisor program. And with that program, when you become, if you become a certified welding supervisor or are interested into that, it focuses very heavy on welding management. And I think tremendous opportunities exist uh, when it comes to welding management, such as the PFMEA example that Padre shared with you. Jason, we've talked about the management system called a no system system, yes. welding management system. That's one of the four management systems described in the Certified Welding Supervisor Manual for Quality, Productivity, and Improvement. It's, an, it's the orange book on the AWS's website, bookstore. Great book that talks about the economics of welding. And I think one of the things, too, that we often overlook of is um, one of the things that, that I call is essentially the moron theory. A weld starts at a design. And the designer says, you know what, we'll make a 316th fillet weld, but we'll put in a, 
the, the, they calculate the fatigue like for a 316 skillet weld and they say, you know what, let's play it a little bit safe and make that a quarter inch skillet weld. So we're going to add air quotes more on. But what they did is they added 77% more weld volume going from 316 to quarter inch. Then the welding specialist gets it and says, you know, maybe with my parameters, 052 electro, GMAW, uh, quarter inch might be a little challenging. Uh, we're going to upsize that to, to five sixteenths. So they add more on, and they end up, uh, that adds uh, 56% more weld volume. And it just keeps dominoing as it gets to the welder and increasing by the more on theory. Well, that's more on when it comes to more on weld volume, but it also deals with the cost. And so having these welding management systems in place can help save um, pain points, can help with weldman issues, but really at the bottom line is the costs. It helps that in-process monitoring uh, to make a part or product that could be welded dependable, safely, and uh, uh, economically. All right, we're going to go ahead and take a quick commercial break. This segment of the Arc Junkies podcast is brought to you by Strong Hand Tools. Makers of my favorite fabrication table, the Rhino Cart, and other fabrication tools and accessories. Right now, Strong Hand is running a special promo for schools and sending out free sample kits. All you have to do to get yours is go to stronghandtools.com backslash arc junkies. We're also brought to you by Isotunes, makers of Bluetooth headphones that meet OSHA and NIOSH requirements to be used as hearing protection in the workplace. You can save $10 on your first pair by going to isotunes.com and using Arc Junkies 10 at checkout. Now let's get back into the show. Yeah, I, I think, you know, like when you mentioned the moron theory, I thought that was freaking brilliant. And I was I was texting Nate Bowman uh, like the first day of class. I was like, hey, man, I'm in I'm in class with Charlie and Bedraic right now taking the welding procedure development because I know he's doing the same one out in Los Angeles. I can't remember the date that that's coming up, but he's going to the one in L.A., him and Rush Kane. And he was like, ask Charlie to tell you about the moron theory. And I was like, literally, he just covered it. And I thought it was brilliant, you know, because everybody thinks that, you know, more is better. And that's, that's kind of how, like, that was my thought process coming up as a welder that, you know, okay, it's, uh, I'm not sure what size weld to put on here, but if I put like a big old honker on here, it's, it's going to hold better than, you know, if I put some dainty little weld on there. And so it's always bigger is better. And that's simply not the case because, you know, now we're putting more heat input into the part. And if it's a heat critical component, you know, we're, we're probably going to experience some cracking issues. Uh, like you said, you know, with, um, you know, welding management, you know, we're going to, we're going to pay two to three times more. You know, you had us do that little theory on, you know, if we had to weld, you know, 10,000 linear feet of this much weld metal, how many spools are we going to need? Okay. Now, if we just increase that weld thickness, you know, or that, that weld size one sixteenth, how much are we going to use? And it's a significant difference. Like you said, 77%. I mean, that's, that's a huge cost, you know, as an employer, you know, when you start passing that down the line and everybody starts cheating it and saying, no, we're going to, we're going to bump that fillet weld size up, you know, and then the next guy says, oh, you know, quarter inch, you know, we're going to bump that up to five sixteenths. The next thing you know, you know, they're putting a five eighths weld on there and it, it's like three, four times the cost of what it, you know, what it was actually going to cost to make that, that part hold initially. And that's one of the things I talked about in the, um, the, just the tip Tuesday last week is the different resources that are available for welding. You know, like here's some of the books you want to like put your nose into and, you know, the, the, the quality and productivity manual by Jack Barkov is one of the ones that's the one that I'm cracking into next. That's the one I'm going to peel back. I've had that book since I went to take my CWI and now I want to pursue my CWS. I've had that book sitting there. I think I've opened it up. I've probably read two pages in there and just closed it and said, no, I'm not ready yet. But like after going through these different classes and understanding the value to it, like the CWS is something I want to pursue. It, I, you know, I know I'm not going to make a, a million dollars off this, you know, credential or having this endorsement with me, but that, I think that's the next step in my journey is to now take on the economics of welding. I understand what it takes, you know, for something to pass, what a quality weld is supposed to look like, how to, you know, qualify a procedure, how to qualify personnel. Now let's start getting into the economics. What's it going to cost to qualify this person? What's it going to cost to qualify this procedure? How can we, you know, streamline things and make it better? You know, so I think that's that's the next step in my journey. Pretty darn good step. When you get it, you know, it, say you happen to, you know, you get into a shop and then you share that information, right? You know, you share that information with the, the welding staff and the, and the welding specialists. Maybe you get the engineers in the same room so everybody gets on the same page. Um, 
you know, we, we talk about the moron theory, right? You know, everyone down the line just wants to put more and more weld on, um, you know, but I mean, let's face it. I mean, most of the, most of the welders that you work with, and I will say for the most part, obviously there's going to be exceptions, right? But they want to do a good job, mm-hmm. right? They, they want to lay down good welds. <clears throat> they want to do a good job. So we talk about, you know, what's good, right? Well, they look at that, you know, it's supposed to be a quarter inch fillet weld. They look at that three eighths fillet weld and to them, that's good, right? It's people upstream, ahead of the welders need to be better at, at taking that knowledge that we're talking about, you know, uh, how much the weld volume grows as you increase the sizes, people need to be better at bringing that down to the welders and giving them training and helping them understand it. Right. You know, you can't blame somebody for not knowing what they don't know. Right. You know, so I think it's, I think it's incredibly important to have people in those roles, like you said, that are learning about the economics and stuff like that. But then when you get back to the shop or the plant or whatever, making sure everybody has that knowledge. Yeah. That, that's the biggest thing. Cause at the end of the day, like you said, you, you don't know what you don't know. And Charlie, I like the fact that, you know, when you were there or, you know, at the, at the class, we talked about, you know, stick welding versus flux core welding. And so you said, if you're going to do like six inches, weld, you know, stick with the fl- or stick with the stick welding. But if you're doing more than that, you know, more volume and stuff, switch over to a flux core application. Yeah, I mean, we always want to, we love the welding. We love welding. I think all three of us absolutely can, can state that we love welding. Uh, but we just got to be aware that some processes may lead themselves to better economic decisions uh, based off of the conditions that they might be set in. So, for example, robots, they're not good at, they, robots are good at welding. They don't necessarily want to chip slag. So if I can avoid a slag driven process on a robot, that, that may be advantageous to me. Um, what I was going to mention though, is I think when you, when you mentioned that you're looking at what am I doing next? I think it's super exciting to hear, you know, what you're doing next. You're planning to do the CWS seminar next. You just said, I know Pedraic's doing the, welder performance qualification endorsement mix. And I love the fact that everybody, I love the fact that everybody pretty much like I was talking to Nate Bowman, he's taken some other classes and some welding and exploring different. I think the coolest thing about our business that we're in, uh, even people that listen to your podcasts and people that we all talk to, um, the welding industry is kind of a tight knit group of people for the, and, and that really essentially goes from people that absolutely love the business that we're in. And, and essentially we're our business. Like I worked at Lincoln. So we, we pride on our innovation. I've been at Lincoln about 10 years. And, and one of the cool things is, is we pride ourselves on innovation and essentially everything in this world is created by somebody no smarter than you. And so when you look at that in our welding business that we're in, specifically arc welding, it's fairly young. So we have so much opportunity to grow and to learn and to network with each other. And I think these kind of uh, channels are really helping the, the next, uh, next group and, and the current group to, to be even more passionate. I know a lot of us are passionate about welding, but become even more passionate and try different things and try new things. Um, It's just a really exciting time in the industry right now. When we talk about accountability and traceability, some people might get, Oh no, but, but wait, I mean, there's technology and welding machines now that, that help with that. So, so you can get the economics of, of a weld to the exact dollar, how much time it takes to make that. And I think, uh, as long as people are willing to continuously learn and stay passionate about uh, the industry that we're in, we're going to just, we're just going to keep uh, growing. And it's, there's a lot of exciting stuff to still come. And, and it's nice to hear the, you know, that, that the seminar that you went to, that you, you learned a lot, but you know, not for nothing, you know, all those people there who were in that, that seminar, you know, were, were all CWIs, you know, at their at their respective companies, you know, we're, we're the guys, you know, we're the top guys. Right. And if I stand in a room with a bunch of people like that, I'm going to learn a ton too. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, and, and it is a lot of fun. Like Charlie says, you know, you get a bunch of people who are passionate about welding in a room together and they enjoy being in the room together. 
you know, we all want to bounce ideas off each other. And we all come from these, like, you know, these different parts of the industry, you know, maybe I come from one industry, you come from another, you know, they're a little different. There's going to be things that you're way more familiar with than I am. There's going to be some things that I'm more familiar with. And that's when you start getting together, you start bringing those ideas together. That's when it's a ton of fun. Um, you know, and like that welding procedure development seminar, you know, that was, that's one of the most fun things for me about it is, is just being in the room. Like with, like Charlie said, with passionate people, you know, you're going to learn something. Um, and you know, we're, we're welding nerds, man. Yeah. I mean, other than hanging out with, you know, guys like you, like I don't get to nerd out on welding with people. No one else thinks it's cool, but welding nerds. Dude, that, was, that was the thing. And like, you know, like, like we've said, like the welding community is, it's a vast community. It's huge. But then at the end of the day, you know, when you, you start running into the same people, you realize how really small the welding community actually is. And, you know, that's the cool thing is like, you know, surrounding yourselves by other like-minded individuals and quote unquote, like nerding out with other people. Like I had a blast hanging out with you guys. And like the whole time we were there, we didn't talk about like hunting, fishing, you know, any, anything else. It was like, Hey man, what kind of procedures are you working on? Like, what do what do you, where do you yep. see the industry heading? Like it was all well nerd stuff and like full <laughs> disclosure because Lincoln electrics is a sponsor of this podcast. This, my, my attending this seminar had nothing to do with my sponsorship with Lincoln. I, I paid full price just like everybody else did, but I, I understand the value in the class that I was, you know, going up there to take having, you know, Charlie cross and you as the instructor, that was an added bonus, you know, because we we've got history together, but it was just an amazing class. And like you said, everybody else that was there, you know, you got to learn from, you know, what they're doing over at their companies and you know how they're doing it and how they're increasing productivity and decreasing costs and coming up with new innovative procedures and processes and, learning hyperfill and the cobot. I mean, it was just, it was a great week to get up there and, you know, learn more about welding. And like you said, you know, nerd out that it, it was a blast. Absolutely. Well, and you know, looking at the different ways people use technology, right. You know, you talked about power wave manager earlier, um, you know, and what, what we were talking about really just kind of scratches the surface of, of some of the stuff that power wave manager is capable of. Yes. Um, but, but there's this deal inside power wave manager called uh, weld score. Right. Where, you know, basically as say the welding technologist, I can train the machine, you know, do three welds, six welds, 10 welds, whatever. And I can train the machine to know what a, like a 10 out of 10 weld is. And then it kind of extrapolates what a one out of 10 is. All right. Um, and you know, I used to use that for, for hiring, right? Like I was trying to come up with a way to really quantify, um, you know, somebody's performance when they did their weld test, when they were hired. So I use weld score, right? It's not necessarily how it was intended to be used. Um, but it was an interesting use for it, right? You talk to people who use the technology and use the stuff around the industry and you pick up all these little, these little tips and tricks and how they do it and how you do it. And you talk to those people, man, it just, it just increases the, uh, the, the tricks that you got in your bag. Yeah. And I, I like having that fact to quantify somebody's performance when it comes to employment. You know, you, you, you get all these people that like, I went to school, I've been doing this for 20 years. They want to come in, they want to take a test. They want to, you know, get a job in, in welding, but having the ability to actually assign a score based off of the type of work that you're, you're doing, like, this is the type of work that we're doing. I'm going to show you how to do it. Can you repeat that? Okay, yep. you got a 30, you're probably not a good fit for this position. Okay, you got a 70, 75, okay, maybe we can work with you. You know, you probably got some trainability. But just having that type of technology in a piece of welding equipment is is mind-blowing. Yeah. And then Absolutely, the, uh, right. And you talk about trainability, right? And that was one of the things I used to use it for. I'd have them do the test plates twice. So I'd have them just do the test plate, look at what their score is. I'd give them some instruction, then they'd do it again. And, you know, you might have somebody that got a 30 the first time around, but man, with a little instruction, now they're at that 70. Yeah, that I can train that person. Yeah. The neat thing about weld score is it doesn't have to be by hand welding. It can, it can be duplicated on a robotic application, which is very advantageous. And uh, essentially, we go back to, to what gets measured gets managed. And so what Pedraic was stating is using WeldScore to train people 
we have a set point of what that person, what the measurable is, effect is and how you can manage that person, whether you need to tell them to slow down or speed up. They're dialed in and they're, they have a set point to follow. No, I, I think that's great because now you have, like Padraig said, quantifiable data. Like I, I nerd out on data. Like what's the results? What's the numbers? I want to see something. And, and, you know, like Charlie, what you said, what gets measured gets it gets managed. And if you're not measuring thing, if you're not measuring the data, if you're not measuring, you know, the processes, the procedures, you can't manage it. You know, you're just like, okay, weld it up. You know, if it, if it looks all right, we're going to send it out the door. At the end of the day, that, that could be a costly decision as an employer. Well, you know, it, I, I think that that can be an incredibly costly thing, right? And it's, it's, you know, how do you measure the data and how granular do you get with the data? Like how, how deep do you drive down? Right. Um, you know, and in, in, in any system, like if, if you're trying to do data analysis on anything, right. Garbage in is garbage out. Right. You know, you have to have good data, uh, going into it. You know, if, if, if I'm looking at a welding program and they say, yeah, man, in this workstation, I'm having all these problems. You know, I had 30 defects on the last, uh, on the last part or, you know, whatever. I can't really do a whole lot with that. Right. What type of defects did you have? Mm -hmm. You know, are, are, are you tracking that? Um, you know, cause then, you know, where, where on the part did you have the defects? Um, it, were you able to maybe assign the welder to the defect? You know what I mean? It's, when you're looking at a program like that and gathering data, it's like, how deep can we get? Cause the deeper you can get, it makes solving the problem a whole lot easier. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you realize you got 30 defects, you're like, man, there's just a ton of defects all over the place. But if you get really granular, you realize, well, one welder was responsible for 25 of those. Well, now you can pinpoint training to the welder, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's all about how deep do we get with the data um, that really makes it usable and actionable. Right. And that's one thing just probably for my own shits and giggles like when you when you guys are like working with employers and companies and stuff have you found that a lot of like companies are open and receptive to that type of feedback like you know because because my thing is a lot of employers that i talk to the last place they want to put their investment or their you know their capital is into new technology new welding machines and training their current staff so, I mean, have you found that, you know, some of the bigger companies are, they're open to, Hey, you know, we've been running this process for years, but this new process over here, or this new procedure, this is going to increase productivity. And then we can bring, you know, people in and we can train these guys and we can get them all set up and, you know, we can, we can start turning out more products. I mean, have you found that a lot of employers are receptive to adopting new technology and upskilling their welders? Yeah. And I think, well, Taking a step back, I think what you're seeing right now is just a, an immense need to train train welding professionals, is what I like to call it. And what you're starting to see now is, at least Lincoln, we're very proactive. We have something called the LEAPS program, Lincoln Electric Partner Schools. What we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to speed up the training for people. If you're going to go work in this industry, in the shipbuilding industry segment, what kind of welding techniques, technologies are you going to be used? You need to learn how to use that are going to train you faster. So that way you can get a job and get employed faster. Um, if you are working in a heavy fab market, are you using cobots? Are you using uh, a, a robot, robotic welding cell, or you may be using a semi-automatic welding cell. What kind of training do you need to do? It's no longer the days where we're going to start off with oxyacetylene welding, we're going to do shield and metal art, we're going to do this, and you're going to get a little bit of everything. It, it's starting to become, at least from training, if things are starting to become more focused, at least what I'm seeing as a current theme. Now, granted, Having a wide variety of that knowledge is definitely critical to know how to do. But what I'm starting to see is, is programs and, and training for people are getting left with schools and, and industry. They're getting focused more on to what they're trying to produce. You know, back to, you know, kind of what you, you know, what you're talking about, you know, you're asking, you know, are people receptive to change? 
right? Are they receptive to changing up their programs? Are they receptive to doing new things? Um, and especially when it comes to the high technology side, um, like say going from like a standard CD process to maybe getting a, a power source that offers some more advanced weld modes, some pulse, um, getting into some different stuff. I think they are receptive, but you have to make a connection for them, right? You have to be able to look at what they're doing. And like Charlie says, where the pain points are and really articulate why this new piece of equipment is going to alleviate that pain point. Um, you know, if, if you look at a, you know, a, a power wave, you know, it's got, you know, over a hundred different weld modes on it for different materials and, you know, multiple modes for welding carbon steel and stainless and aluminum. Um, you know, if I bring that into a facility, you know, 95% of those modes really might not do a whole lot for them. Yeah. But if you can figure out what their problem is and say, man, you know, maybe rapid arc is, is really going to solve that problem for you. If you can make that connection and, and, you know, and help them solve their problems with the technology. Yeah. I do think people are really receptive. Um, but you know, when I look at all those different weld modes, right. Um, I look at solutions like to me, all of those weld modes are solutions to problems. Um, I mean, that's what they were all invented. Well, that's what they were all invented for. That's why there's so many different ones, right? They were invented to do something very specific. Um, you know, because we didn't have something that could do that in the past. If you understand what those weld modes are capable of, you bring that into a shop, you see that, you know, um, you know, they're having a, an issue with, with vertical up, right? I mean, if we look at a uh, precision pulse, for example, you know, that was originally marketed as vertical up pulse, you know, it gives you a very, very tight focused arc. You can put the arc exactly where you want it in the vertical up position. You know, you explain that to somebody. Well, yeah, now they're going to be receptive because you've solved the problem. Mm -hmm. But if I go into a place and I say, look, I have this machine that can do 800 things. Uh, they're going to say, well, I don't do most of those. Yeah. So, I, they, so yeah, I don't tell need me, it. Tell me a machine that'll do one of those things. Yeah. Sell you a machine that's, you know, bring you a machine that solves your biggest problem. Well, yeah, now you're going to be receptive. Okay. That's, that's the biggest thing I found. Cause I see so many people running, running shield of metal arc welding when they should be running flux core or, you know, like out for field applications or in the shop and they're trying to run, short circuit when they can switch over to pulse or, you know, gas or yeah. Yeah. Pulse welding or metal core or even flux core applications or flux core gas shielded. It, it really depends on, you know, what the end user is doing. And it's like, there's a better way, you know, we, yep. we have new technology. We have all this stuff like the cobot and a lot of people are afraid of robotics. You know, they don't want to see automation. The end user, like the, the, the average welder doesn't want to see, a robot, you know, they bring that robot in and like, I know my heart would be going through the roof. Like, uh, okay. You know, they brought a robot in. I'm out of a job. No, you know, if you understand the welding theory, they've just created his job. You, you now have job security because you're going to be the one to go over there and train that robot how to weld because it doesn't know how to weld. And like you guys had the cobot rep there. He said the same thing. And it was like taking the words right out of my mouth. It's easier to train a welder how to program a cobot than it is to train, uh, you know, robotics tech, how to weld. And at the end of the day, you have to program that robot to be able to do the welding, you know, and, and somebody oh, yeah. that understands programming, they're not going to be able to do that because they don't understand travel speed, wire feed speed, voltage, travel angle, work angle. They don't, they don't understand that. So when they have a defect or a discontinuity, they don't know how to correct it, but a welder does. Yep. Well, I think, yeah. I mean, cobots, I mean, they are collaborative robots you know, they were robots that were made to work in a cell with a person, right? I mean, it's, it's a lot different than, than, you know, the, uh, you know, your, your other types of robots, right? It lends itself very well to working in the cell with a welder, um, and, and helping speed up productivity. Right. I think if they change the name to like my little okay. apprentice, <laughs> it'll, it'll like clear up a lot of things and like People will be more receptive of that technology because like, hey, look, now you got somebody to do all your welds for you. You're just going to tell the, you know, you're going to tell the robot what to do and it's going to do it for you. Uh, co Cobots are a very, very powerful tool. Oh, um, and I think you got this. I think you got to see that, right? Um, you know, one of the things that I really like about Cobots is the idea of using them for procedure development. Yes. I, I think that's a, I think that's an incredibly powerful place that you could use a Cobot. 
um, you know, at the end of the day, right. You know, I want to make sure that the, the welding procedure itself is going to give me good results. Right. And then I can train the welders how to, uh, um, how to repeat it. Mm-hmm. But I, I think that's a great way to take out some of the variables during procedure qualification and really see, okay, is this procedure robust? And, and you can have a quick turnaround time when you're using a cobot for a procedure yeah. development. That's another big benefit. But also when you think about the cobots, associate the term welding professional with a cobot. Cause you're essentially, you're not just a welder, you know, procedure, you know, the procedure side, because you're going to be setting the wire feed speed. You're going to be setting the voltage. You're going to be setting travel speed before changes. That's going to require you to know more than just how to operate a machine. So that's why I like to use the term welding professional. It's like this. It's like you guys were talking about training people. The, Newer equipment has could have several buttons. It could have several menus behind a digital interface. And what you essentially come to, be, to learn how to become is a welding professional when you're operating an advanced piece of technology equipment for welding. You don't have two knobs anymore. We well, have two knobs, but you have a bunch of menus behind that. And all of that stuff was designed for some reason to mm-hmm. solve some pain point. And so if you understand all the uh, parts of that machine and the internals of the machine, you're going to be able to solve some problems. You're going to realize why, why there are so many buttons on a machine or why there are so many hidden menus because they are designed that way. Well, and, and, you know, we, we've been talking, you know, touching a little bit here and there on like program management, right? It also allows the, the person that's the, the technical lead on the program um, to decide, okay, what, you know, what level of adjustability do we want our welders to have? Um, you know, because you walk into shops all the time and, you know, Jim likes to weld it at these settings. You know, you touched on it earlier. I like to weld it like this. He likes to weld it like that. But how often do you realize that people are really going outside of those ranges that are allowed on the WPS? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, so as simple as making sure people stay within the ranges, right? We were talking about power wave manager and, and power wave equipment, you know, it will allow you to save your settings in the machine, but save them within limits, right? So I can lock my machine I can lock in the settings, but I can also allow some adjustment for the welder, you know, depending on exactly how they like it, but to keep them inside the acceptable usage range of the WPS. Um, you know, so it still allows the welder to have, you know, to, to have some flexibility, but it gives, it gives the people running the program, the peace of mind that yes, they've got some dial, you know, they're able to dial the machines in a little bit, but I know I'm within the ranges of the WPS. Right. Or, I mean, you can even take it a step farther. Uh, and this is something that I've done at other facilities. I'm not going to say that every, every welder was super fond of it, but I've gone as far as to completely lock the user interfaces out. Mm-hmm. I save the programs in the machine. I completely lock the user interface and all they can do is, is change the, the settings with the, uh, with the trigger. So you can do it on any, uh, on any end of the gamut. Uh, when you when you're using the advanced technology, yeah, I I do like the fact, and as much as people are gonna hate this, but like I've in my welding experience, I've been held to a specific parameter. Like you can only have, you know, X amount of amps plus or minus five amps. I mean, it was it was that critical on on for shielded metal arc welding. You can have 165 amps and you get plus or minus five. Well, damn, I don't like to weld there. Well, you better figure out how to weld within these parameters because that's what's approved with the procedure. And they they literally locked the machine out. I couldn't do anything but go up or down five amps. So I think having access to that technology because, like you said, it's it's proven. And what gets measured gets managed. And we've measured, you know, these these parameters, and this is what works. If we go outside of these parameters, it does not work. So everybody has to weld within these means. And having the ability to lock that machine out, that's going to make me a better welder because now I have to adapt my technique to meet the requirements. You know, and I think at the end of the day, it's going to make you a better welder by being able to do that. It's going to make you a better welder. And it's, 
it's also going to help you sleep easy at night. Yeah, because you know what you put what you put in worked. That's it. You know, um, I, I worked in transportation for a long time, right? I and mean, we built commuter rail cars, so uh, train cars that people took to work every single day, right? You know, and it's you know funny enough. I mean, I was I was building these at a point that my mom was actually taking those same trains to work in New York City. Um, but you know, when I looked at it, you know, so here I am, a welder you know, and I'm welding these things, the same things my mom is driving, riding to work every day. Right. And that's the viewpoint I had of it was, you know, how do I know that I'm putting out a good product, right? My mom rides these things to work every single day. They have to get her there safe and get her home safe along with the other million people that do it every single day. Um, and you know, if you really think about it like that, from a welding standpoint, that can be a lot on your shoulders. Yeah. I mean, I mean, really think about it. If you're building skyscrapers, if you're, you're building, you know, transportation, rail cars, you're building bridges. I mean, there's a lot of people that are relying on you to put out a good product. Um, so for me, like using procedures and using them within their, their qualified or pre-qualified ranges and knowing the results you're getting, I mean, that's what gives you the warm and fuzzy and helps you sleep at night when you go home. Uh, go ahead, Charlie. Well, it even, it even comes to the fact, too, is I, I was just talking the other day to my friend Scott Prince up in New York. And yes. What, what do you, how do you evaluate a weld if you're not following a code? We have, we have a kind of a WPS. It's not to a code. And he goes, how do, how do you evaluate a weld if there's no codes? How do you tell whether it's good or bad just visually looking at it? The, the response is, I'll, I'll give you four things. Four things that I look at is flat face, proper placement, fairly uniform, and good washing. If I don't have a code, at least I can follow those four items. Yeah. Is a weld, does a weld have a fairly flat face? Or is it excessively convex or excessively concave? Is it fairly uniform, the whole length of the weld? Or does it look like it's... Does it look uneven? Is it placed properly? If it's a if it's a fillet weld in a T joint, and I'm putting my first first weld pass in, is it is it about at a forty? Does it look like it's about a forty five degree electrode angle into that joint? And is it washed in, or is there significant undercut? Is there is is there some type of? It doesn't does it. Is it flat face, proper placement, fairly uniform, or good washing? You know, you, if you can visually look at something and see those four things, if you're not following the code, if you, if you kind of made your own WPS together, at least you might be able to fall asleep saying, at least I'm being proactive. You know, Charlie, we, we got to figure out how to whittle that list down so it's like three plus one. There we yeah. go. I, I know you like your threes, Charlie. So we got to figure out a way to whittle that down. Cause that's like a, that's a, that's a strong statement right there. And I agree with you a hundred percent, right? You know, if nothing else, at least you have these basics in place. Um, but we got to figure out how to get it down to three, Charlie. Yeah. No, I, I love that because you've got different, you know, visual weld acceptance criteria, depending on, <laughs> You know, whether you're working with the AWS code, API, ASME, CWB, everybody has their different, you know, acceptance criteria for, you know, visual weld inspection. But I mean, at the end of the day, those are pretty much the four critical parts. You know, if I have to judge a weld, yeah, does it have a, a smooth, clean tie in to the surface or other previous welds, you know, for multi pass? Is, is it relatively, you know, uniform? Uh, do we have a flat face in there? You know, like all that stuff is. It's, I mean, that's, that's basically, you know, when it comes down to it at the end of the day, would you be proud that you left that weld on whatever part you put into production? And like, you know, and I, I'm sorry. even, I'm sorry. even like, you know, like my back in my days as a, a structural welder, before I had all the, the appropriate training I actually needed to be a structural welder, you know, I would look at welds and be like, you know, if, 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 uh, if, if my family and friends were to work in this building would I be happy with what I left behind? No. Okay. Cut it out. Redo it. Okay. Is that better? Yes. Is it, is it adequate? Yes. Do I feel confident leaving that, you know, knowing the, the service that this, this product or this building is going to be under the load, you know, whether it's 
cyclically or statically or, you know, the wind load, am, am I going to be, can I sleep at night knowing that I put this weld in at the end of the day? Yes. Okay. On to the next weld. And that's kind of like, that's what I help myself to because welding can be life or death in some instances. You know, if you put a bad weld in case in point, we did a job out in Tampa and we, we had a pre-manufactured building. And we set it up and as, as well, I, I didn't set it up. I had a buddy that was, you know, he was a superintendent on the job. His guys were out there working this job. I did several jobs out there, at the, you know, the same facility. And as they were erecting the steel, the whole thing just collapsed. Boom. And there was no welding on our part to be done on this building. We had people that, that got life flighted. We had people that got hauled off in ambulances. We had people that had lost time incidents and it was nothing to, it had nothing to do with, with what we were doing. It was a prefab or prefabricated metal building that we were just doing the install work on. We did not do any secondary welding whatsoever. When the insurance company came out and they did their investigation, they found that, you know, whoever welded this together, they, they completely missed the joint on like 35% of the welds. Uh, you know, a bunch of the welds were undersized. Most of it was performed with gas metal arc welding short circuit and, you know, it, it was on thicker material than that process is recommended for. So you can tell that the company didn't have any procedures and checks and balances in place. And now we have people that got injured during the construction of the building. Could you imagine if that building got put up and it was in service and collapsed? I mean, you know, like structural failure happens at the speed of sound. Boom, done. You know, it goes from freestanding to on the ground in a pile of rubble at the speed of sound. So, you know, you have to take you have to take pride in, in the work that you're doing. You have to understand exactly what you're doing. And when you pull that trigger, you strike that arc and you have to be proud of the work that you left behind. And does that weld, can you sleep at night? Did that weld yep. meet the minimum visual acceptance criteria? Has it been tested? Is there a procedure in place? Because at the end of the day, lives can be on the line. But you know, you, you talk about your birth stuff, friends, after, you know, um, you know, how do I know if that weld is good? Right. You know, if I'm not working to a code, um, and, and I, I would, I would argue that whether or not you're working to a code, no matter what you're doing, if you strike an arc, it's your responsibility. Um, it's, it's your responsibility to make sure that that weld is sound. Right. And working to a code or not, I don't think there's a whole lot of excuse for not doing validation. You know, and, and it's, it can be basic, basic stuff. Um, you know, that's, I like to teach fillet weld break testing to ev. I mean, I I'll, I'll teach it to kids in, in high schools. You know, when you're dialing your machine in, grab a, grab a piece of scrap, weld it, put it in a vice. I mean, you can break them in a vice, mm -hmm. you know, you don't need a bunch of equipment for it. Um, and these are just little easy things that we can teach students so they can, even if it's just in their shop, right. You know, making sure their settings are dialed in just right. Do a quick validation off you go. Now, uh, one of the things that I often hear, so we talked about the, you know, if you're not following a code, the three plus one flat face, proper placement, fairly uniform and good wash in. But a lot of times people will just look at a weld and they'll say, yeah, Jason, you're a good welder. Yeah, Padraic, you're a good welder. Or yeah, Charlie, you know how to weld. And it I really, I mean, one of the things, I don't know if you noticed this with the seminar, for example, our road procedure seminar we just had is I allowed you to, you know, we allow you to do GMAW or flux core or shield and metal arc. Well, the reason why is because people tend to focus on either what they're, what they're used to working to. I mean, how do you consider somebody a good welder, Jason? You teach students all the time. And what do you measure? I guess the question is, how do you measure that? That's a, that's a loaded question because I've had some really great stick welders that, you know, they don't do so hot when we get into other processes. And I've had some really awesome MIG welders. They can't fall back and do stick. So you, you've got some welders that are process specific. You know, they can do one process really well, and that's, that's the one that they focus in on. That's the type of work that they get into. But then you have other welders that you know, they, they kind of understand each and every process that we go through and they'll, they'll test out to it and they'll do great work. And I've always, I've always found it funny, you know, like everywhere we go, you know, like you run into somebody that are like, Hey, what do you do for a living? 
oh, I'm, you know, I'm a welder. I, I teach welding. Uh, I inspect welds. I sell welding equipment, you know, whatever the case may be. Oh, yeah, my, my uncle was a master welder. I think that's a loaded term. You know, I've never, I've never seen that in, you know, like the library of information that I have. I've never seen master welder and like, you're not going to find that in the AWS standard terms and definitions. You're not going to find it in a API 1104 code book. You're not going to find it in ASME. I don't think there's so there, there's somebody that's actually considered a master welder, because if you tell me that somebody's familiar with all processes, all positions, all base metals, all filler metal combinations, you're you're full of crap. It, it's not going to happen because there's there's so much to welding. Yeah, so, I find that the more and more I learn about welding, the more I get into it, the I realize like it's like the less and less I know, the deeper I the deeper I get into it. Right, the more you see what's out there, the more you realize what you haven't been exposed to. Yeah. Um. You know, and that's, that's another one of the cool things, man. Um, you know, so, I, so I've only been at, at Lincoln electric now. I think I have a, a, a full like five months tenure at this point. Um, you know, that's one of the things that I think is, is so cool about it is that, you know, we have people that have expertise in all of these different processes, right? Right. They may not be a master of every process, but we have people that have expertise in all these processes. So when I have questions, you know, I can go to these people that really are the experts, you know, in, in these individual things. Right. Yes. Um, you know, when, when you build a team of people, you, you don't generally build a team of people that all have the same skills. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to build a team of people that, um, that are all passionate, um, you know, and Charlie, uh, Charlie sent me a video the other day, you know, of, uh, of a players, um, that are passionate, that want to learn and they want to learn from each other. Right. So yes. it's, it's kind of, it kind of behooves somebody to build a team full of people that have varying experience. Cause like I said, the more and more I learn about the welding industry, I realize that I know a whole lot less than I thought I did. Yes. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because I say it all the time. The more I learn about welding, the more I realize I don't know anything about welding. You know, like, I, I think I know a fair bit. A lot of people, you know, they, they throw a lot of credibility my way. They're like, oh, you're an expert in this. And no, I'm not. And then I crack open like a, a metals and how to weld them book. And it's like, damn, I really don't know anything about welding. Oh, yeah. Like I, <laughs> yeah, metals and how to yeah. break out like Omer Blodgett's books. Like, yeah, um, yeah, I, I mean, I thought I knew what I was doing. <laughs> I know way less than I actually thought. Like the, the, the Blodgett thing that, you know, Charlie showed me at the – uh the development class, I was like, that's freaking brilliant. You know, just being able yep. to calculate my travel speed by the diameter of the wire that I'm working with, or, you know, the, the, oh. the size fillet weld that I need. Oh, the Bar that was the Bartonian conversion. The Bartonian factor. conversion. Yes. That thing right there it's is fun like, to say. that's freaking brilliant. Dude, that's how, you know, we are all welding nerds. Cause Charlie can say, you mean the Bartonian conversion factor? We all go, yeah, that's the Isn't one. That awesome. Yes. <laughs> That is probably one of my favorite tools. We use it every day uh, for procedure development. It is just a fantastic tool uh, uh, that Dave Barton developed. Uh, and really, essentially, if you know the deposition rate, for example, um, say it's 10 pounds an hour, uh, if you're making a 5 16th fillet weld, you would just times it by one and you would get your travel speed. So your travel speed would be based off your parameters. Kind of just in there. That's I've, so. I've got a, so I, I think that, you know, I'll post that conversion factor in the show notes because it's, it's freaking brilliant. And I was like, man, this is, this makes life so much easier because like, as you know, becoming a CWI and testing welders, developing procedures, okay, what the hell's the travel speed on a pre-qualified process or, you know, pre-qualified, you know, joint design or whatever the case may be? How do I figure out the travel speed without actually walking out to the shop, dialing these parameters, doing a fillet well brake test or a bend test? That Bartonian conversion factor is freaking brilliant. So I'm, I'm going to use the hell out of that. That's one thing I'm going to like cut out from the seminar, laminate that and put it right there on my cork board above my desk. Now, 
we got to be careful too. We uh, everybody uses just so everybody's aware. Whenever we use the term pre-qualified, we're focused on pre-qualified WPSs. Yes. Yes. Just like in in it, whenever pe- people will throw around pre-qualified, and they use the term very loosely. Just validate that they're talking. Just correct them. All that we we learn. Just correct them. Are you talking about a pre-qualified WPS? Because sometimes people get confused over qualification and pre-qualification of WPSs. And for example, in, in D11 2020, Clause 5, the title is pre-qualification of WPSs. Right. So that's that's under it's under everything underneath that umbrella. Yeah. And that, that's one of the conversations because I, I still get it mixed up to this date. And that's one of the conversations I was having with one of my welding instructors today. Cause he's like, Hey, I want to go for my CWI. And I was like, my eyes lit up and I was like, Oh, cool. Here's how you want to tab your book. Here's, you know, like I pulled out the, uh, you know, the part B book of specs and I pulled out the wit book and the wit, you know, the, the study guide. And like, I was like, here, take this for, you know, take this exam first. And like, I was going through the whole process and I said, but remember when you're going through the test, you have to know whether they're talking about qualifying a, you know, whether it's procedure qualification or process qualification or personnel, you, know, you have to understand what they're asking in the question to navigate to the right portion of the code book. Because the acceptance criteria for one isn't the acceptance criteria for all. So you have to understand mm-hmm. the differences between them. And he was like, man, this, footnotes. this is a lot. Oh, footnotes, man. Watch it. You better watch it. Oh, the footnotes watch, will get you. Watch it. Yeah. <laughs> Charlie does it the best. He's like, he's just like kind of going through the class, you know, talking about everything. He's like, like dead looks, you know, just a death stare to somebody in the audience. You better watch it. You know, he's got that look to him. And they're like, oh, wait, did I, did I screw something up? No. But now you'll remember to pay attention to the footnotes. The footnotes, the, the devil's in the details, man. When you're taking that exam or when you're going through developing a, you know, a WPS or a PQR, the devil's in the details. Check your footnotes, whether it's for, you know, the joint configuration or, you know, even in even in the uh, the C1.10 that I refer to all the time, you know, you get into to the like um, the L56 wire. There's a footnote in there as well, you know. You got you got to subtract two volts if you're switching over to seventy five twenty five because all these were were tested with one hundred percent CO two. So like check your footnotes with everything that you do. And I think uh, you know another thing we we talked about is uh, performance and procedure. You know, one of my, one of the cool things I've been super blessed to be able to have the opportunities Lincoln Electric has given me and being able to work with outside folks such as uh, Rick, Dr. Richard Campbell and, and Teresa Melfi and, and Walt Spurko. And so one of the things that I you know, always watch whether you're work, whether you're talking about procedure or performance. And, and one of the questions that I've always, you know, even listening to Dwayne Miller is there, there's stuff between procedure and there's stuff between performance and then we always have to remember that the code books are history books. Code books always lag industry. So we talk about new technology. So we talk about stuff. So do we just need to be aware that the code books are the code books are history books of telling us best practices and things that we should adopt? But uh, but there's still a lot of future research going on right now. I mean, I'm doing some research. I've been doing some research today on unlisted steels and, and utilizing, we're going to utilize the co- collaborative robot and some exciting things that are going on with that. So, um, like I said, to circle back, I mean, the welding industry, just having a bunch of passionate people, but passionate people that are always constantly willing to learn what's next and mm-hmm. willing to like, go above and beyond and research a little bit better. I love the stuff that, you know, Jason, I see your school doing and Scott's school doing and, you know, Tim Babers on, on College of the Kings and even stuff that we have um, uh, uh, going on with Ryan Eubanks school. And one of the things I love is you're teaching welding professionals. And I've heard to be a good welder, you, you've got to be, you want to be in a, a seven or eight out of 10 at, 
every single at, at, at the five core processes. Mm -hmm. And um, teaching the people the parameter side, understanding where to find the information is critical for, for at least the future where we're going with accountability and traceability with, with the welding market. Yeah. And that's, that's one thing I really admire Scott Prince for. He, like he's up in New York, but like we've had conversations. We back we we bounce back and forth between LinkedIn direct messages and and text messages. Is you can tell he's really passionate about wanting to teach his students the correct way of doing things and introducing them to new new processes, new technology because he doesn't want to, to get hung up on this is the way we've been doing it for twenty years. You know, you can you can tell that he cares. With, with what he's and, doing, what he's trying to implement in that program. Uh, super smart guy, but I, I really admire what he's doing because a lot of people, they, they get hung up on, this is the way we've been, we've been doing it for 20 years, so this is the way I'm going to teach it. It's like, no, we're not doing OxyFuel anymore. You know, there's there's better things out there than short circuit. Like, here's here's some newer stuff that, you know, that's actually being utilized. And this is like cutting ed, edge technology. Yeah. And you it's know, exciting. Oh, I was going to say, uh, you know, working in the group that Charlie and I do um, in Lincoln Electric is really, really interesting. So, I mean, to, to, to those of us listening uh, or those of you listening, uh, Charlie and I, although we work for a, you know, the, the largest you know, manufacturer of welding equipment in the world, we actually work in technical training and education. Um, you know, so and that job encompasses, you know, going into people's facilities and doing on the job training with them, doing qualifications um, inside of their facilities for them, custom trainings, uh, doing, doing courses like, uh, like you attended a couple weeks ago in Atlanta procedure development. Um, so we're on the training and education side and to do that effectively, you have to be as avid of a learner as you are an educator. Yes. Cause you know, cause just like these guys, you know, um, you know, Scott, you know, trying to bring in new technology, you know, if you want to keep the people that you are instructing on the cutting edge, you have to stay on the cutting edge. Yes. Um, and it just, it, it makes it really, really cool having the opportunity to get to, you know, to get to work with, you know, people like, you know, people that are running these schools and bringing in new technology or people that invite us into our facilities and, and entrust their training programs to us. Um, it's really cool to work with them um, because you have, as an instructor, you have to learn. Um, and it, it really keeps you on your toes and keeps you at the top of your game too. That's, that's the best part about welding education. It, it's exposed me to so many different areas that I would have never been exposed to had I stuck with, you know, what I was doing previously. And like you said, you know, you've got to be just as much of a learner as you do an educator. And that's why I love attending these workshops. Cause like I go to a workshop and I'm like, okay, okay. This is great information. I, I write all the notes down. I take all the manuals and I go back home and I study them and I review my notes. Now I can give a class on this stuff, yep. and, you know, and, and then you, you know, you start teaching this stuff. And then like, that's what you, really when you grasp it is when you start teaching it, you know, is that's, that's when it really starts to click and make sense. That's my Eureka moment. You know, like I talk about the Eureka moment when I'm working with students one-on-one -on -one in the booth and they finally grasp the concept that I'm trying to convey to them and they're like, yeah, yeah, I understand it. Yeah, I understand it. And then all of a sudden, one day, boom, it, it clicks. That's the eureka moment. And you can see it in their eyes. That's what I get when I go to these different seminars and workshops. I get that eureka moment. And it's like, boom, all this makes sense. Charlie, your your big six makes sense to me. The, the, the way to do things in threes, it makes sense to me. And then I come back and I put something together. And now I can show my students this because this is the way that the industry is headed. And I can kind of convey that information to them and get them excited about it. And then we go out into the lab and we put our hands on it, you know, because as welders, we're, we're, we're hands-on type of people. You know, we, we, we're visual, we're auditory, but I mean, like the majority of us, we got, I, you can tell me all day, you can show me, you can, I can listen to a podcast, but until I actually walk out into the shop, pick up that MIG gun or that TIG torch or that stick welding electrode, now I've got it. You know, once I put my hands on it, I've mastered it. And that's what gets me excited you know, that's, that's my Eureka moment. You know, I can come back and show them exactly what I'm learning. Yeah. And Jason, um, I'm out of the, uh, Lincoln's world headquarters in Cleveland, Ohio. And I worked out at the welding technology training center. One of the cool things is we have all kinds of seminars and people really ask, you know, what's, what's so special about it. 
essentially, it's a giant research and development playground. Yeah. I mean, Padraic will tell you about the first time I met him. It was probably, he was there, he was there attending, it was before he worked for Lincoln several years ago. It was before he was even, uh, uh, before we even knew each other, really. He was he just hanging out on a break for, from a seminar and we're talking about stainless and one thing led to the next and let's go out in the lab and let's try this. And, you know, but Jason, what you said, you know, it's getting out in the shop and doing it right. Um, that, that, that really kind of, that really kind of connects it all together. Cause you know, it's funny cause Charlie and one of the other instructors who, uh, or one of the other trainers who I, who I now have the pleasure of working with Joe Oshner, uh, they were telling me all the things that, that this machine can do. Right. And I was using power wave, uh, power wave machines currently, but they were telling me about all the things that they could do. And my, my initial was response was, yeah, no, I don't, I don't think it can do that. And, uh, and Charlie and Joe looked at that and said, Oh, well, we'll show you. And it, dude, they blew my doors off. I mean, they blew my doors off with the capability of this, uh, of these machines, but you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a week later that I took, you know, what I learned on kind of that chance encounter. And I was back at my shop running PQRs. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's, you see it, you go, Oh man, you have that Eureka moment. And then you get to put it into practice, Yes, man. That's a, that's a cool experience like that, that learning and developing, uh, I don't know, you know, phase of a project or, you know, that, you know, for a welder, when you learn something new, then you put it into practice, man, that's a super cool feeling. Yes. I, I love that part about welding is like once it, once it clicks, you know, and I, I don't know, maybe I'm just a weld nerd, you know? Be, yes. Cause you can like, especially as an educator, like I can catch certain students and I can see like, you know, their, their eyes light up and their ears perk. And then we go out there and we start working on this stuff. It's like, okay, you're, you're going to do well in this. You have a passion for this type of work. Like I, I have to understand why does this work before I understand how it works. And I, I think that's the biggest thing with, with most welders. It's like, okay, you, you tell me this works, but why? That was my biggest question go, growing up. Like why? And people used to get so pissed off at me, you know, like when I would ask, you know, like, why, why, why am I doing this? I'm not, I'm not like second guessing your judgment. Like I want to know why, like, tell me the theory behind this. How does this work? You know, I was the kid that got a tool set for Christmas and was like taking things apart to see what made it tick, you know, and then, then seeing if I could put it back together. Like that's always been my like driving force is why, but once I understand the why, you know, why something works, then I understand how it works, you know, especially with wells, like you were saying, Padraig, when like fill it well, brake tests, That'll show you exactly. Here's here's why we don't do certain processes or procedures on different types yep. of material. We snap it in half. Boom. Here's here's the why. Yep. There's there's no there's inadequate joint penetration, or you know we we didn't punch into the root. Here's why. Or why oh. technique is an essential variable. Exactly. Right? You know why if it says if it says to run a stringer. Why do we run stringers? Because that's how it was qualified or that's how it was validated. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, if it says to do a weave, th then that's how you do it. Yeah. Right. Cause that's how it was, you know, tested or validated. But why? Um, but why? But well, why? because that, and if you don't have the data, there's really no answering the why. Right. Exactly. We got to break it apart. We got to cut it. We got to bend it. Boom. Here's yep. why. And now that's, it's sunk into my mental repository. <laughs> I get it. Now I understand why. You know, I, I think it's interesting, you know, talking, we've talked about kind of, you know, the more you learn about welding, uh, the more you, you realize that like, man, I, I don't know as much as I thought I did. Right. Yes. Um, I'll tell you the one thing, like getting into like the technical side of welding, I would say that one of the things that has changed the most for me is when I was a welder, you know, you, you read a book or, you know, you watch a YouTube video and they show a technique and you take a, you take a rule, right? Like, you know, push versus drag or, or stringer versus weave, whatever. And you say, you know what, this is good. This is bad. This is better than this. And you apply it to everything, right? So yeah. you take this rule and you apply it to everything. But then when you get into the technical side and you, you really start digging into the testing, it kind of, it kind of takes you back a little bit. Cause you start realizing like, man, you know, this technique is awesome. 
but it's only awesome when I'm doing this particular type of it stuff. It works in this box. It, exactly. But then this technique that I always said, you know, wasn't as good as this one. It really excels in this other place. You know what I mean? You, you, you realize that these kind of hard and fast rules that you apply to welding as a whole, they, they, they really don't apply. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, which I just, I always thought was very interesting, you know? So when I hear people talk about welding techniques, you know, what's better, what's worse, what's this, what's that? Like, I mean, I don't know what process are you running? What position are you running in? Yeah. Um, you know, what type of gas are you running? What type of wire are you running? Like Charlie said, the big six, like I got to know all of those before I try to give you an opinion on what I think is better or worse. Like there's too many you know, variables, way too many. Um, but then you start digging into the testing and, and the validating and um, it just really opens your eyes to the industry. Mm-hmm. 100%. I mean, I've, I've, had to, I've had to use toilet bowl cleaner just for, for an etch test and a pinch before. So, yeah, I mean, validation can be done many ways. It's not very hard to do. And uh, how about you tell them real quick about the uh, – about the fillet weld brake test, like when you saw that in Atlanta, the Drake almost came like bursting in. I was in a different room. He came almost bursting in the room. Charlie, you have to see this fillet weld brake test setup that's down here. It is the coolest thing. I'm building one tomorrow as soon as I get home. I love things that are functional. I love things that are functional, right? But I love things that are simple. Mm -hmm. Right. And this is why I say there's no excuse for not doing validation. There's just no excuse for it. Right. Cause this fill it well break test deal was made out of like a piece of 12 inch channel, a piece of six inch channel, a long bar, right. To, to get some leverage on the top plate when you broke it and to stabilize the whole thing, you parked a fork truck on a little tab that held it in place, right? This was using tools and scrap metal, Yeah. right? That, I mean, really in, in pretty much any structural shop shop around the country, you're going to find every bit of material that you need to build that thing. Right. Um, I mean, you saw it. I mean, how long did it take for us to weld out a fillet weld to cut it, to do a macro and to do a brake test 15 minutes, maybe, maybe. Right. Um, and that's with, I mean, and I think to etch it, we used a PC board etching from, uh, from radio, radio shack. shack. Good luck finding a radio shack. So I want to <laughs> good luck finding the radio shack. I, wanna but go- I guarantee you, if you look on Amazon, you can type in PC board etching yeah, and it's- you can find it from somewhere pretty darn cheap. So the funny thing is, oh man, there's, there's so much in that little conversation we just had. I found like we had a radio shack that opened up here where I'm, where I'm located and then they shut down and then they reopened long enough for me to go buy some PC board etchant. And then they shut down again because it's like they went bankrupt, but that's what I used for years was the PC board etchant to do all my macros to show students. Here's a macro etch, you know, here's, this is why short circuit works great. And this is why pulse or, you know, spray transfer is even better. Charlie, I want to go back to, you know, you said toilet bowl cleaner and we kind of skipped over that. So I want to, I want to bring it back for the folks that, you know, like as a young welding educator, you know, when I first started out, it was the radio shack PC board etchant or Naval jelly from like, if you could find it at your local home Depot. And then you told me something at the, 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 um, the weld procedure development class. I was like, wait, what dial that back again. So you said toilet bowl cleaner. I want to go back to that. When you're in a pinch, it can it can work. When you're in a pinch, there's a there's a gamut of things that you can find to do your macros with, uh, whether it's night all or or the PC board at cleaner. But when you're in a pinch, if you have to get something done, you can find you can find stuff that you can make it work if you're pretty creative. And also, just a word, you know, if you if you polish it pretty nice and you add a little. I added a little, you know, make sure it's hot still. And yeah. you can, you can pretty much get a good result no matter, uh, as long as you're using a suitable, suitable method. But what did it's you use in the dollar store? What's that? What, what, what is the product that you actually use that you were able to find at a dollar store? 
Oh, I used Works the one time I had to do it. There you go. Yep. Works toilet bowl cleaner will work in a pinch. If it, if it works, it works uh, for, for doing macro etches. You know, um, it, it's important to remember too, though, right? Um, when, when we talk about macros from a code perspective, um, I mean, there are times that you're using macros and micro examination where you have to polish and etch to do real metal graphic examination. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we talk about these things, PC board, etch and works toilet bowl cleaner, I mean, they're not, that's not what you're using in a lab, right? right? But like you said, out but in if the I want to do a demonstration and I don't want to have to pay hazmat fees, like case in point, the, <clears throat> the aluminum etchant that I have to buy or that I had to use, it's like a five to six day waiting period to get it from California because they have a specific like D1.2 aluminum blend for using this stuff because I couldn't source it locally. So, like, just as a welding instructor trying to show what macro etching is, you know, being able to cut a cut a test plate apart, buff it out, go to the dollar store that's literally around the corner. I can hit that up at lunch, buy some magic toilet bowl cleaner, come back, rub it on my test piece, you know, maybe, maybe throw the test piece in the rod oven while I run up to the Dollar General to pick up some toilet bowl cleaner and then come back and be able to rub it on there and show the students, hey, look, this is where it punched into the root. This is the effective throat. This is the theoretical throat. Just be able to show that because like as welders, we're, we're visual learners, you know, so we, we want to be able to show this stuff and not all the time. Can we, you know, get nitol or, you know, these specific blends like you would use in a lab. I mean, generally for doing well, uh, for doing like working in a lab, um, what I find ends up working the best in a lab setting is instead of buying <coughs> pre-mixed etchants, um, you, you kind of want to get yourself a kind of a, a, a mix of some different types of acids so that you can make your own etchants for whatever you're doing. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, whether, you know, some nitric acid, some hydrochloric, some hydrofluoric acid. Um, and if you're working in a lab setting, then you can kind of make the etchants that you need, right. you know, depending on, on whatever you're doing. Right. But like I said, that's a lab setting and, you know, um, I'll say this. I had never done the works toil bowl cleaner thing. I had never done it. Right. And it wasn't maybe a week or two weeks before the procedure development class, uh, that Charlie said, dude, it works, right? It works. Um, I ended up getting some, and I will tell you that if the part is warm, it absolutely does a serviceable job doing a macro. Nice. That is a guarantee. I'm going to have to give it a shot now. Do it. Do it. You'll be happy. Do it. And get Do yourself it. a fork truck and some 12 inch channel and you'll be doing validation testing all day, man. So the <laughs> funny thing is like I left that class on Thursday, Friday, I came back and did well performance tests or well certification tests. Monday, I was already building my fillet weld brake test jig. Like I've already got, uh, I've already got the handle and the piece and everything made. All I got to nice. do is get my macro edge. Cause as soon as I cut it apart, I got to do a macro. Then I can do the bend test. So now I've already yep. got my handle, my fixture, everything's already prepped, ready to go. Just yep. need the macro etch. Well, and you know, for doing like performance qualifications, stuff like that, like that stuff works great. I mean, those kind of field shop, uh, etchant solutions, mm -hmm. those things work great. I mean, you know, there are some standards that if you look at them, when they talk about doing macros for performance qualification, they will specifically tell you, um, that you do the macro without magnification. Right. I, the, I mean, these are not meant to be metallographic examinations, right? This is, do you have fusion at the weld interfaces? Do you have fusion to the root? Not necessarily beyond. Mm -hmm. um, and and, and things, that's all you really need is those kind of field etchants. And you can do a serviceable job on a whole range of materials. Right. One of the things that I do too is I try and take my six inch scale and I'll scribe it. I'll scribe the joint. If we're doing a macro one of the things I see a lot of people forget to do just to, just for a quick validation is for fusion. Um, it's just take a scribe, take, take like your, your razor blade and your six inch stone and finish the connection so that you can see the amount of fusion, just visually the amount of fusion you're getting in that T joint. Are you saying like draw like the intersecting lines through the weld so that you can kind of get an idea of where the root is versus your penetration? Yeah, imagine, imagine like where the base base plate is. Yep. So you have a reference line of where the base plate should be. Mm -hmm. 
and you can actually clearly see how much fusion is in there. Because because fusion's good, and and if you're doing groove welds penetration, but but too much can be a too much can cause cause a centerline crack. So so you never want the weld be. You never want the, another good exercise with doing this is. When you're, when you're dialing in the big six, you, you dial in the parameters and a good exploration activity for teachers is try and make a well bead that's deeper than it is wide. Whenever you're arc, for arc welding, a well bead that's deeper than it is wide can lend itself to a center line crack. So a good activity is just to check the fusion. But if you want to, if you want to do some, some analysis or some, some more research. Uh, that's why the codes usually state a one-to-one -one width to depth ratio. Some codes will state the weld bead is 1.2 to one depth or 1.4 to one depth ratio. I've, I've noticed you always want the weld uh, bead. Yeah, you always want the weld bead to be wide for arc welding wider than it is deep. And uh, uh, there's a whole there's a whole presentation we've got on 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 cracking but center line cracking it'll be it'll happen typically when the well this when the materials are over at 400 degrees fahrenheit it'll be a hot crack i got you right down the center of the well feet okay so before we get out of here i talked about um different resources and stuff last week in the podcast charlie i i see you've got a very impressive library behind you most folks at home can't see that but if you had one book in that library behind you that you could recommend to somebody, what would it be? Oh, it would be probably two. I can't just recommend one. I'll take two. I, I have, I can give you two. And the one would be the procedure handbook of art welding design and practice. Uh, we're on the 14th edition. It's what people have known as the welding Bible. And uh, as you can see, I have every set behind me. And then the other, the most important recent book that I found very valuable in the welding industry is AISC Design Guide 21. And it's what I use in every seminar. Uh, and it, it was written by uh, Dr. Dwayne Miller. It handles anything from welding connection design to codes, to, to, to well procedure specifications, processes. And really, he, I believe that every, almost every sentence in that book had thought of what he put into it. So I, I have a high respect, and I've read that, yep, I've read that book three times. So okay, and AISC then, Design Guide 21 is probably the best book that's recently out in my opinion. Okay. And then, Padraic, what, what book or code or spec would you recommend for like, you know, somebody wanting to like dive deep, get into that rabbit hole, kind of take that next step in their welding journey? So my, I, I, I again, I, I think I'm going to have to go with two here. Um, one is uh, base metals and how to weld them. I, I think that's a phenomenal, phenomenal book. Um, you know, it's going to take you through all sorts of different base materials, give you a real good understanding of those base materials. Um, and it'll also get very, very specific. So if there's something you want to dive deep into, you can dive deep or you can just get a good broad overview. Um, and for somebody starting out, you know, you never know what you're going to run into. So you get that project where it's a new base material. You can start looking at that book and start to figure out, you know, you know, what is that going to need for, for preheat post heat? Um, you know, how does that material react? It's a phenomenal book. Um, and then I would say just for an all around standard to have, um, you know, minus having like a specific code that you're working to, I think the, the AWS B 2.1 is, is a phenomenal standard to have, um, in your arsenal, right? It, it'll go over different types of testing that you can do if it's workmanship testing, right? Even if you're not working to a code, it gives you some, some guidelines to just doing workmanship testing, you know, how to set that up. Um, you know, how to, you know, testing fillet welds and shear, you know, it gives you, it, it's, it teaches you how to do that, how to do break testing macros, um, you know, the basics of procedure, uh, develop, uh, procedure qualification and performance qualification. I think that's a phenomenal book to have. 
both great resources. All all four of them are great resources. So before we get out of here, is there anybody? What about you? What What about me? Yeah, I'm partial, <laughs> man. I would I would I would at this point in my my journey, I would say like the quality and productivity manual from from Jack Barkov because you know I'm wanting to obtain my CWS. And like, I'm, I'm a stuck up structural welder. So I would say like, you know, leaf through that D one, one code book, sure. but then also the, the arc welding manual from, you know, James F. Lincoln. I mean, those are, those are all great books. Um, hell, I put out a whole list of my library last week. Don't put me on the spotlight. No. <laughs> no, you you I, know what? I'm, I'm sorry. I don't think we can, I don't think we can get out of the podcast without me say it. Um, I think all of our lists should have been three because we should have thrown in the ANSI Z 49.1 was, safety standard. Damn it, I was just going to say that it was like <laughs> step one, we put thrown some that in there. safety glasses on, make sure you got the appropriate welding shield, make sure you got fume mitigation Z 49.1. Like I refer that to everybody and everybody that like, for some reason this past couple of weeks, I've been hit up like multiple times. Like, Hey, I'm getting ready to take my CWI exam. What do I need to study? Okay, yep. step one, yep. take that Z49 because a lot of people don't put a whole lot of weight to that. There's a lot mm-hmm. of questions in that, you know, part A on Z49.1. So make sure you understand yeah. safety and welding, cutting and, you know, all uh, all that stuff. Like, that's a, that's, and it's free. Go, it's, you know, it's exactly. It's right a free click download. download. Right click download. You know, 69 pages, boom, done. Um, but yeah, I think like, I'm you know, sure it's referenced. Oh, hey, pretty sure it's referenced. Oh yeah. Hey Charlie, that, that puts them in threes. There we go. We're in threes now. <laughs> threes are great. <laughs> puts them in threes, brother. Well, before we get out yeah. of here, is there anybody, we'll start with Charlie. Is there anybody you want to give a shout out to? Um, if you want to plug any social medias, resources, websites, anything like that, go ahead, feel free. As, as mentioned before, we stand on the shoulders of giants. So one of the best things is, is, uh, pretty much our group of welding nerds because we all learn from each other, our tight-knit group of friends, uh, you know, the tight-knit group of friends that's constantly growing. Specifically, though, I mean, uh, Dr. Richard Campbell helped me with my become an AWS CWI instructor. Uh, Carl Peters helped me with the uh, get my job at Lincoln Electric about 10 years ago. Huge influence there. Um Ryan Eubanks has been really influential from a teaching perspective. And uh, um, uh, one of my good friends that I sit with every day, Frank Draglich, he, he, he's been at Lincoln for over 30 years, and he's pretty much has shown me pretty much every every rope that I need to know. He's a, he's a recognized authority on numerous codes. So, you know, it's been, it's been, a, great, uh, it's been a great journey, and let's just keep it rolling. Yeah. All right, Padraig, what about you? I'd say throughout my welding career, when I started welding, um, I got to give a shout out to my buddy, Dave Rorig. He's a, uh, I worked with him in NASCAR. He actually, uh, my, the first racing team I ever worked with, he was my, he was my supervisor and he just super smart guy taught me a ton. Um, just a phenomenal person to work with a, an, an excellent mentor. Um, you know, uh, there's a gentleman named Jace Ashline here in Plattsburgh who, uh, you know, coming up in the inspection game, when I started getting into that, he was just always phenomenal to work with, you know, kick ideas off of and, you know, very, very supportive. Um, you know, always wanted to see you succeed and would push you to succeed. Um, you know, and now in, in this kind of part of my life, you know, getting to work with, uh, you know, guys like Charlie and Frank and Joe Oshner and, um, you know, it's just a phenomenal opportunity. You know, I, I think no matter what part or stage of your career in, you know, you find mentors, you know, as you go to that next level or you try to take it to that next level, you always want to try to find that person who's that you want to find that person that's where you want to be. Yeah. Right. And, and if you're lucky, that person is also going to be willing to give you some knowledge along the way to help you get there. I think, uh, you know, it's kind of a good way to end it. Like Charlie said, you know, a couple of times we stand on the shoulders of giants. So like everybody that's, you know, kind of been on this path before us and everybody that's taken the time to spread that information or pass it down to somebody, you know, we all have mentors we look up to. And like we talked about at the beginning of the podcast, you know, if you're the smartest guy in the room or smartest person in the room, you need to find another room. You know, and that's what I love about these different seminars and classes that I attend, whether it's through Lincoln Electric or AWS or classes at Fabtech, 
you know, go out and do something, expand your knowledge, you know, take that next step in your welding journey. And, you know, I want to thank both of you for coming on the podcast, sharing your knowledge, sharing your insight, because, you know, you're, you're two of my mentors that I'm looking up to and, you know, attending your classes and just kind of like picking your brains here and there. And I know we go back and forth via text message and Instagram DMS is like, how do you do this? And, you know, what's, what, you know, what's the best procedure for that? Um, you know, so thank you for coming on, on the podcast and, and sharing your information and sharing your knowledge. I really appreciate it. And I think the listeners of the podcast are, they're going to gain a lot from this episode. Yeah. You know, thank you so much for having us, Jason. Um, you know, I'm glad you touched on mentors a little bit. Um, you know, <clears throat> you know, we're, you know, some may say we're the young guys in the industry, but you know, we're, we're the ones that will, that will drive the industry forward. I think it's really important for everyone to remember that if you're in a position to be a mentor to somebody and that's how people are looking at you, try to be the person that you needed when you were coming up. Yeah. You know, try to, try to be that person for somebody else. And, uh, and it's, it's really going to make somebody the start of somebody's career or that stage in their career, uh, fulfilling, and it's going to keep them excited. Um, love the love coming on the podcast, Jason, love having you at the, uh, at the training session. I'm sure we're going to bump into each other again. It's a big industry, but it's a small industry. Yep. Small niche in a big industry. That's it. Uh, Jason, continue keep doing what you're doing because it's motivating and, and driving passion into um, more people than I think you realize. And um, to have passion, uh, to have passion, like most of the people that listen to your podcast have passion for welding. And to have passion, it's extremely hard because most people just give up on mm-hmm. something. And uh, by having this this channel, uh, it's very motivating for people. And it doesn't matter what age or what level of skill. Um, having a having a channel that they can having a channel for people to go to and and listen to really makes the time go back really fast for people. Yeah, and I appreciate it. And, and once again, thank you both for coming on. I I really appreciate your time. Thank you for spreading the information that you two have, you know, amongst the masses. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of the Arc Junkies podcast. For more information on the great classes and seminars at Lincoln Electric, head on over to classes.lincolnelectric.com. I'll also put all links associated with today's show in the show notes section. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Just the Tip Tuesday, where I discuss the various modes of metal transfers and their advantages and disadvantages. I hope you all have a great week out there. Stay safe, and until next time, make every well better than your last.